Nice to see everyone here today. We will open up our executive session on House Bill 288 relative to taxation of sole proprietorship businesses. The chair recognizes Representative Fellows for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move ITL on this bill. Is there a second? second. second by Representative uh, Southworth seconds the motion of ITL. Is there, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. Um, so what this bill does is it exempts proprietorships, which are single person owned business, and also single person limited liability corporations from both the business profits and the business enterprise tax. And what we heard from Revenue Administration is they estimated that the loss, once we get a couple years out, would be about 36 million annually if we were to do this. And they also uh, indicated that they thought that this could be exempting just a certain um, class of people being taxed or you know of the of the businesses to exempt a certain type um, a certain type based on the ownership would probably be in unconstitutional and you know they couldn't say before because you know they're DRA but they recommended that it, it should go we should get an opinion from Department of Justice before we would move forward with anything like this thank you other comments Oh, Representative Jinnigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, there's also um, just a fairness mm -hmm. issue with this as well. Um, there's, when you look at the situation, you can have a, a two-person LLC that effectively may gross and net less than a one-member LLC, and yet the one-member LLC doesn't pay taxes and the two-member or, or larger does. Um, and, and I'm also aware of examples of people who have proprietorships that are fairly good sized and bigger than many two person and three person, et cetera, LLCs. And to exempt them and, and not, you know, you're going to have a fairness issue as well. Thank you. Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, I had raised this issue with the um, Mr. Wong, but I'm. Actually, there's an email I haven't read from him yet. He may have answered it, but uh, he calculated the BET loss. But like, like uh, Representative Janigian, I have know of some people that one person a hedge, who's a hedge fund owner and has the rest of his business in New York, on um, who I don't know if he is an LLC or not. But if he is, he's certainly paying BPT. And I should probably mention, for the record, I do pay BET and BPT, so this would impact me. But other comments? Anyone? Yes, Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I think uh, one of the uh, arguments in favor of this bill that was raised is that an LLC is a pass-through entity for federal income tax purposes. But in that case, it passes through to the individual who then files a federal income tax return and pays his tax accordingly. In the state of New Hampshire, where we have no income tax, that analogy does not follow. And uh, passing the bill would result in no tax whatsoever on this business income. Representative Platt. Yes, I just wanted to apologize for the uh, author of this bill, Travis Corcoran, he didn't show up for hearing when we were hearing it. He didn't know about it. His his uh, email was screwed up with the clerk's office, so he didn't get notice on like, five different bills, so he does apologize. I told him what the likely outcome was going to be. I sits next to me in the legislature. Any more discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. The motion on the table is ITL on House Bill 288. Representative Janigian. 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 Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Representative Ullery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. 
Representative Plett votes yes. Uh, Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Lors. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Leapley. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. And the chair. Yes. The, the vote is 20 in favor of ITL, zero opposed. And uh, would everyone be comfortable with this being put on the consent calendar? Any oh, conversation on that? Representative Euler. I have. I'm not sure you can do that with a fiscal. Yeah. Oh, same point. What he said. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is if, because it has a fiscal note, uh, can it be on the consent calendar? So probably not. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, great. Um, and I forgot to re uh, welcome Representative Nodder. Thank you for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. It's riveting. <laughs> what, you think your committee's more riveting than ours? <laughs> what the, committee would that be? <laughs> we, we got Ironworks down the hall. That'd be riveting. The Committee of Nerds and Geeks. Come and visit us sometimes in science and tech. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll close is, the... Is, is there going to be a motion, or, excuse me, a speaker or not? Uh, we'll determine that later pro okay. I, I assume there's going to be no debate but obviously if you made the motion always be prepared to speak if someone has a question okay yes 20 to 0 ITL so we'll close the executive session on House Bill 288 Okay, I'm actually I'm going to recognize our researcher Jennifer Four, who just whispered in my ear some great information. Jennifer, would you explain that to the entire committee? It's my understanding that you can't pass um, that sort of bill on consent, but you can ITL it on consent. Madam Chair. Yes, question, Representative Sherberg? Oh, yes, she said uh, if the con on the consent calendar was 20 to 0 ought to pass, we would need to have it on the regular calendar. We couldn't put it on the consent calendar. Because it's an ITL motion, it can go on the consent calendar. So will it? Uh, we will attempt to do that, but it will be up to the House clerk to decide that, I guess, on parliamentary procedure. We'll mark it as consent uh, because it was an ITL motion and assume that, but in all cases, be prepared to speak. If someone has a question on the floor, if it gets pulled from consent, we never know what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. With that, we will now open the executive session on 297, and the chair recognizes Representative Almy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move on, ought to pass on, oh, ought to pass with amendment on to HB 297, the dedicated funds review. Do you want to present your amendment to us now? Uh, is there a second? Yeah, we should set a second. Is there a second on ought to pass with amendment? Representative Elberger seconds the motion. Could you speak to your motion? Uh, yes. Not very well at this point, um, but on this um, is a relatively a housekeeping measure this year on the dedicated funds. We are repealing to on, on dedicated funds which have no money in them and no prospects uh, of having money in them. Um, and on, we also removed from consideration um, by the dedicated funds committee on five, I think it is, on funds which are 
on enterprise funds of the state in one form or another, and therefore report in full and are audited in full outside of the dedicated funds committee. So we actually do not get the financial information we need to review them. So that's, um, oh, and the amendment, I need to, to request uh, that we pass the amendment on, which has been passed out now to everybody. Um, that is on rewor rewording both of the two repeals um, because we had uh, not remembered to include the second uh, section of each, which um, would st have stayed in the, the uh, law as uh, establishing funds that will no longer exist. The room and board scholarship fund uh, was set up with great intentions by some members a number of years ago to uh, provide for the orphans of fire and police that were killed in the line of duty. But the university was already doing that and declined to move it to a separate place, and so nobody told people that they could donate to that fund. And uh, it has no money in it, and it has never been been used. Um, the cold case unit fund was also set up with the idea that people would donate to um, a fund which could help support the one person in the cold case unit who is doing homo homicide work. And the gentleman retired a year and a half ago, actually. But in the history of the fund, which I think is about eight years, uh, they've had one $100 donation because nobody really knows about it. And I don't know how many cold cases actually get solved that they they have a family that cares a lot about it at the time it happens. But there were, is only $100, which the, uh, in the fund, and we had quite a long conversation about that. And the Department of uh, Safety is going, uh, uh, no, of Justice, is going to be figuring out where to put, to, put the $100 as a cost of the cold case unit and spend it and then send a letter back to the family thanking them again uh, before we close the fund. We've given them until January, I believe, of next year, and they said they can do that. So, so that's the kind of minutia that, that we deal with. Sometimes it's a lot more complicated and than that, but this last year was pretty easy. Other discussion? I think I see Representative Ulrich's hand. Uh, Representative Almy, take this question. Yes. Uh, it's my understanding that any dedicated fund automatically goes in, uh, is reviewed by these, this fund unless excluded, or does it have to be statutorily included? On um, When we started out, on, we started out saying that they all had to be included. On, I, I got the uh, new vice chair of the committee to work with me on it the first time, and he suggested a hammer, which we put in, which said, if we have, if we find you and and you haven't uh, registered in six twelve within six months, then your money is getting taken away, which, of course, we couldn't quite do in some cases, but... Uh, you're going too far. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's ever been done, but it did get people's attention. Uh, but um, there are a number of dedicated funds which, like Seabrook, for instance, which we took off the books altogether early on, but the new comptroller said, okay, you need to leave these in. Uh, the, the University of New Hampshire uh, fund, even though 
the money goes into it and goes out of it so quickly that we don't that it's not registered anywhere um, and the liquor fund and <laughs> and an, never gets a report of on no they they these are all separately audited apparently in the CAFR process I believe it is on um, they are separately audited and they are separately reported I, uh, thank you madam chair I just wish to make that clear for the uh, committee because we're dealing with some dedicated funds further along in the year yeah and I did want to make it clear to the committee when we get a dedicated fund that that somebody wants to establish which they're going to be funded with donations we need to ask them about their game plan for getting the donations so we don't have to repeal them again any other discussion representative Rochford yes thank you madam chair this is a question for representative Almi. i'm i'm looking at the the amendment and i'm looking at the and I, maybe i'm not understanding what the amendment does because i the the copy of the bill that i had originally i i don't see the difference between the amendment and what we have originally in the bill it looks like we've have those repealing that those those things are repealed in the original bit 297. maybe and i could be wrong on, they are repealed on uh, what change well two things that changed one is that on um, you have Roman one but we did not remove Roman two in each case I'm doing all of this without looking at my notes. <laughs> On the, the, the original wording is on the second page, line seven, line, second page, line 17 to 20. Uh, and it repeals, uh, the first one repeals uh, 612-1B-278. It does not repeal 187A, 20A, 2B, which is establishing the room and board scholarship fund. That would have still remained in the law, and somebody someday might have picked it up and said, what is this and why? Uh, and the same thing. Uh, it, oh, and that one also on um, somebody had a hiccup, and in on line 17 it says relative to relative to monies, and I forget who picked that one up, but we got rid of that part of it. Um, and on five, on it also repeals the 612, and does not repeal the cold case homicide unit fund. So line 10 in the amendment is new, and line uh, 6 in the amendment is new, and line 4 is corrected for the hiccup. So whenever there's an amendment like that, some of these have to restructure it a little bit to make it appear proper? Yeah. Yeah. We, we do sometimes find that the la same language has crept into some other uh part of the law too and it's better to just do a word search and try to find it but... other discussion okay seeing none the clerk will first call the roll on the amendment which is 2023-0237-H thank you madam chair uh representative janiggy and this time i got the name without stumbling perfect Yes. Uh, uh, Representative Ollery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Platt votes yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochefort. 
Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Leapley. Yes. Uh, Representative Smith. Yes. And Madam Chair. Yes. Vote is 20 to 0 to pass the amendment. Adopt the amendment. Thank you. And now the motion before us is ought to pass as amended on House Bill 297, and the clerk will call the roll. In a second, I shall. Take your time. Okay. Let's see, that was moved uh, by uh, Representative Almy. Almy and seconded by Representative Elberger. I'm to keep all my paperwork straight. Okay. Um, and uh, same with the, uh, the main motion. You know, we should probably have a second motion on on the ought to pass as amended. Uh, so, would you like to move that? Thank you. On I move ought to pass on on House Bill two ninety seven as amended by, at the moment, Amendment two three seven H. And uh, is there a second, Representative Elberger? Seconds. Twenty three. Okay. Uh, Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Ollery. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative uh, Platt votes yes. Representative uh, Nodder. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Orris. Yes. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Leapley. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. And the ch Madam Chair. Yes. 20 to 0 in adoption. The vote being 20 to 0 of ought to pass as amended. Uh, we will attempt to put this on the consent calendar unless there's any discussion about that. Okay, we will put it on the consent calendar. Madam Chair? Yes. There's one thing I'd like to to tell the committee about um, related to this, but other things that we may get in the future. Uh, when a member brings in an amendment, on uh, then on, uh, and only the members can bring in amendments, but you can bring in an amendment for the sponsor or somebody else, on uh, they the we just passed the amendment is 237h the clerk's office is going to turn that into the committee amendment and it will have a different number and at that point we have to be a little careful about did they get the numbers wrong in the calendar because that's already occurred once this term Okay, we will now close the hearing on House Bill 297, excuse me, the executive session, and we will now open the executive session on House Bill 569 and recognize Representative Ames for a motion. I move, I move a retention on House Bill 569. Is there a second? Representative Elberger seconds. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, and thank you. Um, so this is a bill that uh, might be thought of in three different parts. One is um, to change the way the tax is collected and deposited. And the second is uh, relates to the low and moderate homeowners property tax relief program. And the third is a study related to uh, uh, property tax that's embedded in rent payments. And so um, on the first part of that, uh, which is often ref it's a, a, a component of the law that's often referred to as swept retention, this bill would, instead of allowing for retention of excess swept, I should have said excess swept retention, uh, it would require that all swept proceeds net of a 3% uh, collection allowance for the municipalities 
would be remitted to the state and from the state would flow out according to whatever formulas were then in place um, to presumably school purposes, but it could be broader than that depending on how over the years it gets characterized. So it would be all money flowing into the state net of 3%. That's one component of it. And the second component is the uh, tax relief program and this bill would change some of the numbers in that, in that and uh, also uh, provide relief from the school tax as well as the swept uh, tax. Um, and then the third element speaks for itself. It would be simply a study uh, of, uh, of the issue of uh, property tax viewed more broadly to include um, its uh, payment through, uh, through rent payments in effect. Um, so why retain it? Uh, the, uh, the reason really is that um, we, we talked about it when I presented the bill, that there is litigation going on. It's very interesting litigation and it's, uh, it's reaching, it's, uh, it appears to be, you always have to put in a qualifier there, reaching the end. Um, there is a motion for a partial summary judgment that was filed uh, towards the end of last year. It's uh, being hotly litigated and um, the uh, plaintiffs have filed their brief. The uh, state has filed its, rep its response, its opposition, uh, an intervening entity called the uh, Well, I can't remember the name. It's a group of, uh, of municipalities um, and sympathetic municipalities that um, that pay that, that retain the excess swept. So they used to be called donor communities. Um, concerned coalition of concerned communities, or something like that. It's a different name. Is that is that it? I can't remember. Coalition is for short. Yeah. This, uh, maybe something like that. So uh, the coalition has filed a brief too. Those are in the court's hands. Uh, now the state, uh, they're not the state, the plaintiffs get a chance to file a reply brief to all of that. That's due at the, towards the end of this month, the last week of this month. Uh, so very soon. And then uh, the uh, state and the, uh, these, uh, uh, this coalition um, get to reply or reply to the reply, um, and that's a week later. So, all the briefing will be done by uh, uh, early early March, and then it's in the hands of the court. Um, it's a, a pretty focused issue. I wouldn't be surprised to see the court proceed on it and issue a decision fairly promptly. As Judge Ruoff, uh, he doesn't seem to be the kind of judge that sits on things. Um, so uh, that's a big deal, and uh, the, the arguments in there are interesting. I just will say that from the, from the plaintiff's side, it's a tax issue, and um, the allowance uh, to so-called excess or high property uh, value towns to retain uh, <coughs> revenues that are collected at the swept the statewide education property tax rate above um, that community's adequacy amount is an allowance that effectively returns the money into the pockets of the taxpayers of that community resulting in a disproportionate tax that can be said, said more artfully but basically it's a, 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 sta a argument based on the tax clause in the constitution which is strictly interpreted there's not much deference given to communities if you, you're either in or you're out um, the argument that the state is putting back to that is say no it's not a tax issue the money is collected there's a, there's a uniform rate across the state um, it's received and what the state does with it then becomes a spending issue. So it's, we switch over from, from the tax clause of the Constitution to spending clause. When it comes to spending, the state has uh, traditionally been given a lot of leeway by the court 
to spend, you know, to make up, make its policy and make decisions according to that policy, and the the court is unlikely to step into that. So that's that's the argument that's been advanced by uh, the the um, respondents, the uh, state, and the concerned communities, and uh, and it's novel. It's new to uh, to this case anyway. It was not raised in the several cases in which this issue was raised back in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, we'll see. Uh, and I, I just wanted to share with you, it's interesting. The briefing is interesting. And uh, um, there's no point in going forward with this bill at this time, given that this part of the bill may be uh, significantly affected by at least the Superior Court decision, remembering that always Superior Court decisions can be appealed further. Um, but um, that's where we stand. That's why I'd like to retain it. Uh, beyond that, uh, I, I feel the need to look closely at some of the numbers in the uh, calculation of the refunds for taxpayers, so that other section needs some work. Um, we'll use the time to do that work. So that's it. Any other discussion? Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, during the hearing, um, Mr. Wong said that we would, uh, that he really didn't know much about uh, the municipal part of the DRA and couldn't comment on how this bill works. I think it would be useful if this becomes a hot issue to bring in the municipal part of the DRA and get them to explain how that interacts with the statewide property tax. Other discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll and the motion before us is retain House Bill 569. Representative Janinigan. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, Representative Valerie. Yes. Representative Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Platt votes yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochefort. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberger. Yes. Representative Leapley. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. And the, the, Madam Chair. Yes. The vote is 20 to 0 in favor of uh, retention. Excellent. Uh, so we will uh, retain motion passes. We will close the public hearing on five, uh, the executive session on 569. And I will ask the members, uh, not on the retained motion because that's retained in the committee, but on the other two, if you could have your, uh, what do we call it now? We don't call it a blurb. We call it the report, the committee report done, preferably by one today so that we can get it to our committee assistant so that we could get it in the calendar. Yes, okay, great. So if you could work toward that, that would be great. Now. Okay, we're not too far off. <laughs> we will now, we ready to, thank you for joining us. We will now open up the, uh, pub, are you ready? Representative Ames, this is your bill. Yep.
Okay, are you ready for me? You know what? We could use a pin card from you at some point. Oh. <laughs> but All we right. will now open up the public hearing on House Bill 220 and recognize Representative Ames, who is the prime sponsor and who will do a pin card. Okay, and if I appear a bit frazzled, it's because, uh, like all the rest of you, I am frazzled from yesterday. Um, well, uh, this bill uh, is a bill to, I don't seem to find a copy of it here. What happened to that? Does anybody have a copy of the bill? Here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, House Bill 220 is a bill that I filed um, uh, largely because Representative Abrami, who had led the effort that this bill um, relates to, um, as we all know, was not reelected. And uh, I felt that it important to uh, get this going. Um, I had been working with him, and he would have done this, uh, but he's not here to do it. Um, so the committee establishes uh, or you, one might say continues, a committee to study the regulatory structure of charitable gaming. Um, and you have in the, what I've handed out, the main part of the report of this committee from um, last year, dated November 1, 2022. Um, uh, Senator D'Alessandro chaired this effort uh, it was a totally bipartisan commission. Um, and uh, also on the committee was Senator Gaida, um, and then uh, Representative Doucette was there as well. Um, so we, we, uh, we worked uh, as much as we were able, given COVID and other distractions. Um, but in truth, as uh, as we neared the summertime, uh, Senator Gaida had decided not to continue in office and uh, withdrew from the committee in effect. Um, and um, uh, then uh, I think there was one other issue, but I'm not remembering it. But in any event, we, we visited a number of the uh, sites where charitable gaming is occurring and, uh, and met and talked about the issues and uh, determined at the end that we really needed to have this effort continue. Um, and <clears throat> at the end, uh, I just want to read this. Uh, the committee recommends filing legislation to continue the efforts of the study. The landscape of gaming in the state is highly complex, ever-changing, and growing at a significant rate. By continuing this study, members will be able to move forward in delving into the multifaceted challenges faced by the game operators, the New Hampshire Lottery Commission, and the charities involved. The charge of the committee would remain the same, allowing the members to build off of the work already completed over the course of the past two years. I passed out a news article. Um, it was actually from uh, New Hampshire Public Radio that I thought was pretty good, and it just is uh, hot off the press, so to speak, February 14th. Um, and in here, it, uh, down in the fourth paragraph, uh, talks about the brook. That was one of the casinos that we visited. Um, it is an impressive place, uh, well-run, well-managed, uh, and um, you know, full of interesting things. Um, and uh, there's this statement, and I think this is why we need to study this. Uh, the, the brook is a stark symbol of New Hampshire's embrace over the past decade of a wide range of gambling options, a suite of offerings that would have been all but unimaginable just a few years ago. <clears throat> 
Though a bill to legalize casinos never passed in the state house, I should say par parenthetically that I was deeply involved in that with that bill. I was the chair of the uh, gambling commission that was set up. Um, I think it was during uh, Governor Hassan's time, and uh, this bill uh, followed from the work of that commission, and it got awfully close. I think it was a one-vote margin. Um, but it did not pass. Uh, maybe that's just as well, who knows. But uh, though a bill to legalize casinos ne never passed in the state house, so-called charitable gaming facilities have proliferated and evolved into exact replicas of casinos, complete with craps games, complicated carpet pat patterns, and rows of slot machines. The state has legalized other forms of gambling in recent years, both online and in person. I should say that that reference to slot machines is this reporter's way of describing those machines. There are stark gaming machines. There has been a lot of debate in this committee as to whether they're slot machines or some other kind of machine. Um, and uh, I don't want to get into that debate. But um, this is this is the new new world that's out there. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, I got it. Um, so uh, uh, this is the new world, um, and I think it uh, it prudent for this committee, which uh, has the responsibility taken from the House to monitor and act on all gaming bills, uh, to. Um, understand fully what's going on. Um, and uh, a premier concern um, is not, I don't want to overstate this, a premier aspect of the over, overview needs to be how cas charities are selected and uh, who gets the best gaming days and so forth and so on. Who gets on the list, who doesn't get on the list. and. Uh, it's important that that be fair. Uh, maybe it's totally fair. I don't want to say it's not, um, but uh, I don't. I think there there is uh, that it's important that everybody be on the same page on that. So that's one of the reasons for having this committee. It is a lot of work. I just want to say that getting to Representative Ami's point about dedicated funds, we don't want to set up something that's uh, you know going to flounder. So I think. We do need to think about whether uh, a committee like this can can do the job that's being assigned to it. Um, and uh, I'm not here so much as an advocate for this as to put it before you and tell you about it and uh, about the world out there that uh, we all need to understand and make sure it's functioning well. Um, so that's, I guess, that's the long and the short of my uh, statement here, and um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, take any questions. Questions, and uh, by the way, for the record, I am a in this charity gaming business. I have a little operation right down the street in Concord. Come and visit sometime. Yes, Representative Spilsbury. Well, if you want to see what we do. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Ames, I'm just wondering if you could give us your own thoughts about the potential composition membership of this, uh, your bill is straightforward, I believe. Four members of the House, two members of the Senate. So it becomes a legislative task jointly with the Senate. Yeah. Uh, the committee's report recommends that a commission be formed that includes legislators, the New Hampshire Lottery Commission, facility owners, and representatives from the charities. Two different strategies, and I'm just wondering if you could give us some flavor on what you think would work better in the public interest. Well, thank you for asking about that. The the recommendations the, you're looking at the recommendations page of the report. I think there are two paragraphs. Yes, yes, exactly. From the there, final paragraph on right, page four. There are four. two paragraphs there. The first paragraph is what I read out, and that's basically the study committee, the, the oversight committee that I'm talking about. That's st strictly legislative. The second is calling for a commission um, to focus in directly at the charities issue um, 
it, Senator, uh, Alessandro filed a bill in the Senate, at Senate, nine, Senate Bill 90, um, to do just that. Um, and it called for a, um, an appropriation to support that commission. Um, I looked at the uh, docket this morning for that, and it's, it looks to me like it's been ITLed by, this, by the Senate. So that's, that's gone. Somebody, uh, that should be checked on, but I think that's the status of it. So this is it, and this is uh, just a legislative committee. Um, I, I think if we recommended any more senators, uh, uh, we'd get nowhere, um, and uh, maybe there should be more legislators. But uh, six is a six is a pretty good number, and we're getting used to even numbers. So, other comments, other questions, Representative Phillips. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, having been on EDNA for four years, I know one time, at least one time, we had uh, a bill related to the charitable. Um, gambling and my recollection is that there are a limited number of licenses that can be had for these facilities and we haven't maxed out on those licenses yet so I'm just wondering if part of the <clears throat> charge for this committee would be to just look at that the fact you know the licensing part and and how that fits with what's going on today I would respond to that and say that uh, that would be in, within the charge. It's to study the oversight and enforcement of charitable gaming. Licensure is part of the oversight uh, enforcement. Representative Ames. Sorry, all me. <laughs> Listen, my mind. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our names are very similar. Uh, <clears throat> do you know? know what's happening to the bills in the Senate that do deal with the uh, eight license limit until 24. Uh, there is one that, that uh, I think uh, removes that, uh, says that that limit is permanent. Uh, and I think that there's another that tries to expand it uh, to a larger number, but still finite. And apparently this, these are being taken, debated seriously within the Senate, that and, yeah. and other issues to do with, with the explosion into real casinos. I don't know about the Senate bills. I do know that we're about to hear a bill that um, House Bill 607, is that right? Um, that's, that's, uh, that deals with the structure and uh, various sub-elements of, uh, of the uh, charitable gaming apparatus, the uh, people who run, the, run these ga ga gaming establishments. Other questions for the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, thank, thank you, you very much. And please fill out a pink card. I will do that. I do not have any more pink cards for House Bill 220. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this? No, okay, we will close the public hearing on House Bill 220. And we will now open up the House Bill 607 and recognize the prime sponsor, Representative Doucette. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of Ways and Means. Okay, if I can get my technology to deal with me here. Uh, House Bill 607, my synopsis of this is it's pretty much a housekeeping bill with the three very specific exceptions. Uh, we just heard some testimony in relation to... Um, the growth of charitable gaming in the state and the fact that that model, which we've heard testimony over the years, is a great model, works well for the uh, charities in the state, <clears throat> many of which count on the, the revenue to do their operations in many realms in all our communities. This 
that I just lost. Forgive me. This piece of legislation kind of starts the process of bringing us up to speed, and we will be examining uh, House Bill 220 that you just heard testimony on about getting a committee together to study charitable gaming. But I think we all can agree that the the model we have is is in place and it's what we have to deal with. And I totally lost my presentation here. Please bear with me, Madam Chair, for a sec. Take your time. I just I don't see any more pink cards from any other senators or representatives. So if you are here, please send me a pink card so I can recognize you. Ah. That's from there. The boom is having tech problems here. Bear with me. So. Well, I can speak to probably the biggest of the changes that that's in this legislation that's relative to what Representative Almy brought up and maybe Representative Fellows in the questioning in the prior bill. It's the, for lack of a better ter term, the moratorium on the game-specific HHR, the machines that are sometimes dubbed as slot machines, and, and we've heard testimony, and we know that this is not the case. What we did in the legislation that was passed last biennium was to put a moratorium to a date specific, which is uh, July of, July 1 of 24, for the purpose of the operators that applied to and were eligible to provide that game in their charitable gaming facilities the opportunity to uh, to roll out this game and to see the effects, positive and negative, for the charities and the operators and state revenue in general. In this rollout, uh, I've, I've heard from uh, different folks, uh, the operators, charities, because uh, if I can remind you, part of the component of passing HHR was the ability to double, basically take on a second charity for the day instead of the charitable gaming facility servicing one charity on a specific date, they can now service two if they have the component of HHR. Uh, there was some genuine concern with some on this committee about uh, that particular game and the possibility of proliferation of uh, these gaming facilities throughout the state. Um, and I share that concern. Quite frankly, I'm from Salem, as you all know, uh, border town. That is de definitively a target for those looking to provide charitable gaming, not only the operators, but the charities and the charities in the surrounding areas. Um, it's a, a great pool. back. Back when they were trying to pass the uh, casino legislation, um, the folks in my town overwhelmingly supported it. Uh, the legislature did not. And in 2006, we ended up with what we have for model now, charitable gaming, with the uh, shared revenue structure. So in the passage of the HHR, the operators, if they uh, submit to lottery, and I'm sure lottery can testify to this, they have to patch a, pass a very thorough background, uh, financial and uh, criminal check. And it's up to the commission to designate one or all of those 14 facilities to be eligible to provide HHR. What I've noticed, well, l roll back a little bit. That that with uh, the rollout from uh, from Gel Car, it was kind of stagnated time-wise, and uh, and again, uh, lottery can 
testify to this. I, I'm not exactly sure how many of the game operators applied for HHR licenses, how many have received HHR licenses and are currently operating, or how many may still be in the process of the licensing and background checks. Nonetheless, the purpose for the July 1 uh, moratorium date was was fixed in part as to be able to review uh, the the effects of HHR, the new game, and uh, how things were working out. In my experience over the last year or so, and I'm sure many of you who are in tune with what's going on with uh, charitable gaming, there's been some um, passing of the torch. There's been some larger operators, some multinational operators, so some big, big companies, big players coming into our state and buying up these local charitable gaming rooms. And we can all draw our own conclusions as to why that has happened. And I can also, also attest to the fact that, again, Salem being in its geographical place, there's great interest in my town. We, we in New Hampshire have 14 gaming facilities, 14 charitable gaming facilities. In all of New England, these mega casinos in Everett, Unkinsville, um, Oxwoods, and others, Oxford, there are a total of nine casinos in New England. We in New Hampshire have 14 gaming facilities already. I'm a free market person, make no mistake, but we set limits We set limits currently on gaming facilities. I'm of the belief, and this is the major component of this particular piece of legislation, I'm of the belief that we should allow for these 14 licenses. There may be others out there that have not um, finished up the the process, but I'm of the belief that we should not have, to use a term from uh, testimony last biennium, have slot barns showing up on every corner. I think that there's a place for charitable gaming, a great place. We have some, probably, I'm guessing, probably 1,100 charities that can be serviced. I belong to many of those charities, um, and they do great work. There's also a saturation point. I own some property myself in Nova Scotia, and I can tell you that I can walk into any restaurant, pub, corner store, and other places, and there's video gaming there. I don't want to see that in our, our state. So uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure here relative to this particular component. Secondly, uh, another piece that I would deem uh, more or less housekeeping is the maximum bet component of this. At, at present, a, a player can sit at a blackjack table in one of the charitable gaming rooms and place a bet at a maximum of $10. Um, but I, that same player can also go to the 7-Eleven on the corner and buy a scratch ticket for $25. There just should be some equity here, and it allows for uh, all involved to reap the benefits of uh, the revenue, most specifically the charities, and it keeps us in line with what the Lottery Commission's already doing. We already have a $25 bet. Thirdly is the employees, the licenses for these employees they're required to go through a criminal background check, a fingerprinting process annually, which they have to pay out of pocket, and also pay the state, I believe it's a $100 fee for the annual license. This would extend that to a three-year period for the license, with the caveat of reporting to the state any changes in their status, uh, criminal history, or anything of that nature. It also changes, there's some uh, definitions 
in in the piece of legislation uh, talking about uh, primary game operator and uh, primary game employer. A primary game operator, in, in short, is basically a floor manager, a, a pit boss, or somebody who's managing the charitable gaming facility. Um, so he's the foreman on the job. And the way the law is written right now, he also has to get an annual license, but has to pay a premium, pay a $500 annual fee for his license, his or her license. <clears throat> Um, I'm proposing we roll that back to the 100 and also make it the three year. The, the primary employer is still paying a $750 licensing fee. I'm not touching that, but uh, it's nonsensical for the foreman to be paying a, a $500 fee plus the background checks annually. Um, and the rest is is pretty much clean up talking about I mean, photo requirements and such, but that, that rolls into the initial licensing. There's another component that speaks to, like many employers in the state, uh, the, there's a problem with the recruitment and retention of employees. So some of them may work part-time in one particular facility, work part-time in another facility, and this legislation also allows for them to not have to be licensed in each. They can uh, basically transfer their, their clearance to another facility. So I'd be open for questions. Representative Platt. Diligently trying to take notes here. I don't like acronyms. You used one. What's HHR stand for? Uh, historic horse racing. Those are those machines that were spoken of so lengthy over the past few years, and they finally got passed into law last year, and some of the uh, charitable game operators are at present operating, but I know some may or may not. Some may still be in the process of going through the clearances for that. Yeah, it occurs to me we have a lot of new people to this committee who have never heard about any of this. My apologies. So um, we do have the Lottery Commission here behind you so they can maybe do that if you're not comfortable doing that. Any other questions? for? for yes, Representative Almy. This is rather a long question. As you know, um, I've been trying to fight this proliferation for a long time. On, I would like you to go through and tell and tell us what each change is doing. I can do that. There are severe problems in my communities. At I'm this point. sorry, I can't hear you, Representative. On, um, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> should probably shouldn't have said that because it was a comment about the problems in my community with this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know that it that it'll address specifics to that, but I can tell you uh, the changes that are basically made in this, what I I blanketly said was housekeeping. Yeah. Okay. But why, why do you include game operator employer? Why do you get rid of primary game operator in the second one is I think okay thank you, you for the question that, it's sim simply uh the game uh primary game operator at one point in time early on they were probably and making an assumption now and somebody else can testify to this was probably the primary employer of that establishment now Adding the the definition of uh, game operator, G-O-E, game operator employer, that is the employer, the entity that employs a primary game operator who is, like I said before, probably a floor supervisor, the, the foreman on shift. So they're definitively two different things. Thank you. Representative Schamberg has a question. I'm sorry. Oh. This is for the entire document. Oh, you're going through the... Oh, sorry. Continue. So okay. Well. I think that gets us down to line 10. 
Well, I, I can give you, I have, I have uh, oh, no, bulleted that's not points changed. here. Okay. Expands who must get the primary game operator license. I've already explained that. Yeah. Uh, oh, ooh, something I did miss. It removes the fingerprint requirement for the member uh, list of the charity applicants. Back in the inception in the early years of charitable gaming, as a charity, you had to be on site in a lot. I know at least in Salem when it was at Rock Park, we had to literally handle the money as, as uh, poker tournaments were going off and whatnot. Not necessarily the case now. After the charities are chosen and they receive their dates, um, they're not required any longer to be on premises during those hours of operation. So subsequently, why would we need to do a background check on the treasurer of, you know, XYZ charity? Uh, let's see. Uh, it eliminates language about a licensed equipment dealer. Um, again, others um, can which speak. Which page to, are you on? I'm sorry? Which page? I'm not on a page. I'm on my notes. Oh. Yeah. I, I can just give you an overview of the changes that are done, a synopsis that I wrote down. Oh, well, I, what I wanted was page by page, so I'll just have to try it spend hours figuring this out right I, I what i can do representative if you like i can pres uh, provide for the committee a synopsis uh item for item as to what's changing this and i expect to do that okay. anyway i did not do that this morning yeah, but for um, obvious reasons there, there's yes, some very specific long. issues that that i can uh, single out for the committee that'll be yeah. easy to navigate through Okay, does it make sense, because we have a lot of people that would like to speak on this bill, that, um, Representative, you could follow up with a synopsis of Absolutely. the key things that it does and then where to find it in the bill. It seems like that would be very helpful. We do have a couple other hands up. Representative Schamberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, over here. Thank you for taking uh, my question. Uh, just the background, are, are the present owners of these facilities domestic individuals or domestic corporations or any multinational corporations of the ones here in New Hampshire? Uh, I'd, I'd ask Lottery about that. I'd ask Lottery. Okay. Follow up, Madam Chair. The second question, are there any restrictions by uh, state law or federal law to limit it to individuals or domestic corporations here in New Hampshire? Again, follow up with state yeah okay Out of my thank curfew. you <laughs> and and let me just say also when do you see me with a laptop i had a problem with my printer this morning or i would have provided these things for you and and again apologies <laughs> you can see i, had I have a, a feeling we'll see you back here so yeah, in the committee so. <laughs> okay uh representative Many of us are sympathetic <laughs> yes <laughs> representative fellows i think had her hand up yes well i'm i'm not too too sure like who to ask this question one of the my problems is that some of these sections repeal what was there and changed it to something so i have no idea what the what what's going on in terms of the change but in terms of licensing um i'm i'm confused you have so many levels of licensing i think that the the employees are those all in the um OPLC licenses, but but for the whole facility, the whole who whoever gets the license to say you can even do this, that must be separate. Yes, yes, it is, and I'm sure lottery can. Yeah, we have the experts right behind Representative Doucette, yeah. who hopefully will come up and say what they want to say. <laughs> okay, good. Any other? Yes, Representative Britton. Um, regarding the license, once you get a license, um, what is the limitation on like a size of facility that you can can do, or is it just the sky's the limit? Um, and uh, excuse me, but regarding um, you know the chair's uh, offer to uh, at least check out the facility that you have in Concord, 
I'd like to take you up on that. I, I've never been to one, and it'd be kind of good to see something like that. But. Well, I should just mention, I think what Representative Ames was talking about, there was a committee, and they went on field trips to different yes. locations, right? Yeah, yeah so it, that's always something you should consider doing. You might have one in your community or near your community. Go check it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other well, questions for Representative Doucette? Is there a size limitation on the facility once you get a license? Uh, we can ask that of the commission. Uh, that is something that they would know. Yeah, Representative Phyllis? Just one other thing. Is there any other state that has this model with the um, ch charitable portion of it? Does Do any other states do anything like that? Not to my knowledge. Not, not like we do it here. This Okay, thank you. Repre oh, Representative Platt has a question. Just for the record, I am treasurer of Lions Sight and Hearing Foundation of New Hampshire, Inc., and we have benefited from this law. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think this would be a great time. I have New Hampshire Lottery Commission here. Hopefully they'll all introduce themselves to you. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Charlie McIntyre, uh, Director of the New Hampshire Lottery, and with me is Valerie King, who is the Administrator of Licensing um, with New Hampshire Lottery, uh, specifically for charitable gambling. So um, first, I want to apologize. Uh, as has noted before, there are two very, very similar bills, one in the Senate, one in the House. We drafted fiscal notes for both through an error on my part and mine alone. Um, one was not submitted to you folks. One was submitted to the House. I saw the calendar Friday that indeed that was the case. Uh, my admin forwarded it Monday morning first thing. And so somewhere in your vast edifice exists our fiscal note, which was drafted in time. But once again, I reviewed it over vacation. And the worst thing you could do was read an email. Now it's a red email, and you look like when you go back to vacation, you miss it. So uh, the fault is mine, and I apologize to the uh, chair and the members of the committee. So a number of the questions that you would ask are answered in that fiscal note. It's several pages. It goes through the detail of the changes to the law, uh, the, the definitions, as well as the finances involved. And so uh, certainly we can answer the questions you want to have now, or we're happy to come back another time. Um, after you've had a chance to review it. And once again, the fault is mine. And so I wanted to lead with that, Madam Chair, if you apologize. And we're um, happy to answer questions on the bill you would have. Um, yes. Representative Platt? Just so we don't have to look through the edifice to find it, could you forward to the committee? To the <laughs> of course. I had forwarded it um, to Pamela Ellis uh, Monday, but I'll certainly forward it. Uh, Madam Chair, if you want to designate somebody, I'll forward it to the committee. It's, uh, I could even give you my copy when I leave here, uh, Representative, if you want. So. Of course, happy to do it. Yeah, it'll be before the when I, when I get back to my office. Perfect, Representative Ors, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. This being the 21st century, can't we just make a phone call or something and say send it now? I can actually. Um, I can. Yes, I can. Yeah, I can. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> yes, Representative Albany. I think we desperately need a work session on this to get the new members a background of what has happened and why, and on and to go through the bill, the Senate bill. We I guess we can't do that one yet, and uh, the fiscal note. Director McIntyre, would you be open to rejoining us for a work session? I am absolutely your your um, disposal. Thank you, thank you so much, and deputy, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and that, and actually to that point, there's a number of things. Um, for example, um, Valerie uh, reports to our chief compliance officer, who may also answer questions that you would want to have, and I'll, I'll have him available would have him available as well for the members of the committee or any other. We were, this, this committee is what we report to, so anyone you need, we will make available. Representative Shanberg. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, does that mean the two questions I asked, I should wait till 
you could ask someone else or should I ask Valerie? You, you could ask them again. Certainly, we have an answer. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, are the present owners of facilities domestic individuals or domestic corporations or multinational corporation or individuals? Um, if I recall correctly, they're, they're domestic in terms of their U.S. based. Uh, I don't think they have any interests outside the country, uh, but they have interests in other states. Okay. Follow up. And are there any restrictions by state law or federal law to limit the individuals or these domestic corporations and where they can send their revenue? Um, sure. if, if you mean where they can send their revenue as in the charitable revenue, then it has to remain in New Hampshire. So the charities that they that benefit from these game dates would be New Hampshire based charities. Representative Almy. Thank you. But um, by uh, the way that the historic horse racing, which I see in the me social media and print media only referred to as slot machines now on it has to, a very large payment goes to the uh, place in South Carolina, Florida, which on, um, which runs those machines remotely. Um, certainly that... the, the, the breakdown is what it is. It's uh, three quarters goes to the operator and all their expenses. 25% is split between the state and the charities. Um, the individual arrangements that each of the operators has are made with the what you would call content and manufacturers is between them. Um, I, I I have an estimate as to what it is. I don't know for sure. And it varies by facility and a number of other factors. Uh, follow so, up and then Representative yeah. Fellows. So, so we do not have a right to find out what part of it leaves the state. I mean, certainly we can, we, we do have those. One of the difficulties is the application process is confidential by law. And so I don't know what I can divulge publicly as to the numbers break down various contracts. So I, I, the answer is I, I think we can get that information. I don't know if I can provide it absent some legal guidance. I would, could you just give me some clarification on that statement you just made about um, where the money goes you were talking i think you were talking just about the horse racing but in general that that i i want to understand the business model and what's going on because you've got the gambling and that money part of some percentage of that is going to charity and some percentage of that is going to the state um i'm wondering if these um, entities, I assume they make a lot of money off off the food and, and things that are not part of the the gambling. So I'm just trying to. I've never been to one, and I'm just wondering, like, what is going? What's going on? Um, certainly. So each of the facilities is different in the sense of what they offer inside. And so I'll take, for example, the facility which has essentially all of the revenue streams that you would imagine it could. So we'll say uh, the Brook, which is in Seabrook, New Hampshire. It has uh, table games for which the state receives a significant portion of the funds, which charity receives the funds, and the facility receives the funds. And I can get you the numbers on that. It, it, it has historic horse racing for which, as I explained, the operator re retains 75% to pay all the expenses and the charities and the state split 25%. They also have a license for sports betting, where, sorry, <laughs> I saw the eyes. <laughs> you ask, I, I'm certainly happy to go into this. Um, and so which the there's a DraftKings facility within that. DraftKings, the facility, and us split the profits on that. They also have food and beverages for which their revenues are theirs. We don't go into that. They also have a simulcast license for which they will display horse racing and individuals can go there and bet on horse racing. Yes. 
simulcast. Yeah, simulcast. So it's a live horse race someplace else shown on a TV screen they can bet on live. Um, and that, once again, is split. Most of the money goes to the operator and the track that is showing the race, we receive a small amount. That's essentially the, 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 the gamut of uh, activity within a facility. And it varies off of that, what each facility does and to what extent. And to, it, every time you were saying we, were you, you were meaning the state. So there's just a limited, where, where does the, the chair, or did, where you, did it mean state and charity? Where I said we it was the state receives funding for this. And the, where I said charities, the charity receives funding for this, yes. So I, I, actually, Representative, if it helps, I'm happy to send over a breakdown of what each rev share model is in terms of each thing that do, happens within the facility. If that would make sense to you, the folks, and sort of. Any and all information you could provide the members of this committee would be very helpful. I, and in, again, in we'll, we'll do a work session too, because it's a little bit confusing in matrix form would be great so you can go down and say this one does that this one does that yeah. yes we're happy to do it that could be no more than two pages of a breakdown of each 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 event each function and what the revenue breakdown is all right i saw a hand over here representative leapley um just to clarify i think that's what my question was was to request that information i'm thinking about the presentations we've seen from um agencies kind of to help us understand the revenue overall and i'm thinking that same model um with the revenue broken down by each um different manner of betting would be ideal thank you for that just to clarify madam chair to, uh, to, the, to the member you mean just in charitable gambling right not the overall lottery breakdown because we have there's two different sides of the house it was more than that but so I'm trying to remember what we've seen from the Lottery Commission in other presentations. So yes, whatever was not already covered in a presentation, if we could get that background information, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Whatever you can do. Yes, Representative Almy. Um, just to clarify on that, this year we didn't get real breakdowns, as I recall, on uh, the different forms of gambling and how much how what their revenues were this year we just got the overall number yes yeah, certainly i was waiting uh, for an invitation as to the after the governor's budget is submitted in terms of the revenue breakdown uh -huh. obviously that number was still in flux mm -hmm. because obviously as an executive branch we're asked to make a revenue estimate late fall early winter and then to update that as the budget draws near and i think we made that estimate Representative, I think it was last Friday. So certainly the information was changing as we were getting on. So happy to come back and give a revenue estimate breakdown by category as well as a work session or anything else. Representative Platt. Having not dived deeply into this bill, but scanning it, it looks like it's fairly broad and covers not only uh, uh, the charity gaming, but all gaming. And so I would like to see the matrix cover all gaming, gaming, but what covers charity and what does not? Sure thing. I mean, certainly within the fiscal note that you, we didn't send you, admittedly, <laughs> uh, is a breakdown of certainly the, the changes. Val does a remarkably um, thorough job on these things. And so that should hopefully explain a bunch of it. Um, Representative Ames. <clears throat> when you do, do that, um, explanation or presentation on the uh, breakout of how the revenues are allocated. Um, I think it's important to explain what the revenues are. So in historic horse racing, for example, as I recall, the statute uh, allows, um, it's, it's paramutual betting, but allows the, uh, what, what is it, the commission, the, commission, the entity that's running the historic racing, the casino, to take out 12% from the pool. And then that's the revenue that then is allocated out. So that's an example of just being clear on what we're talking about. So in the end, it's 35% of 12%. That, that's, that's actually, uh, that's correct. Um, it's 25% of 12% of is, 
Um, so, and also that number varies. It's a 12% is, is not a fixed number. It's, it varies by facility and the operators will say floor mix as to what machines are where and how they pay out. Yeah, just a follow up. Um, follow up? Um, and that, that just triggers this further uh, request really that um, if you can update us on uh, how it's playing out, because when we did this bill, um, the estimate was, I mean, the, all, the, all the numbers assumed 12%, but the statute itself says up to 12%. And I know some in Kentucky and some other places uh, were leaving more in the pool, so it was more like 10% uh, taken out. Um, and I just don't know how it's playing out. If you have any information on that, that would be helpful. Certainly, we would have that information as, as the whole of the state as well as by facility. And that decision is made by the, the facility itself, not us. I think that's it for now. Um, it, certainly, the, the the work session we would have an opportunity to discuss each of the individual points as well that we, we might have issues with. So, uh, sort of leaving my thumb yeah. on the chess piece essentially. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, it sounds like you have a long request list. Thank you very much. We okay. will try to schedule this out. Uh, we also have revenue estimates we have to do soon. Of course. So we'll figure out what works. Yeah. Certainly, okay. uh, our my, our calendar is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Very Okay, we will see them back, so don't, don't be worried. Okay, we will now recognize Rick Newman from the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> good morning, members of the committee. Excuse, excuse me. My name is Rick Newman. I represent the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association, uh, which is a uh, association made up of the 14 facilities that operate char charitable gaming in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and we are here today uh, to support the bill. Many of your questions that you asked are excellent questions, and I understand uh, you know some members of this committee have dealt with charitable gaming for years, and others. It's a new subject to them, and I think uh, I'm happy to be uh, a resource to answer uh, questions uh, if I can, and I know the lottery will be uh, helpful in that regard. I'd like to just focus on the bill in front of you and a few of the changes that it makes to the current law. I think uh, Representative Doucette was correct that many of the things in the bill are really sort of housekeeping, and they are issues that were brought... Um, uh, from the lottery to the uh, study committee that uh, Representative Ames and Doucette uh, served on, uh, items such as uh, no longer requiring the charity members to be fingerprinted every year. It's because they don't participate directly in the charitable gaming, that really is something that is outdated. It's cumbersome, it costs them money, it's just not necessary. So that sort of a change is something that I would consider to be really to be a housekeeping change. I think the primary policy changes in the bill, I believe, uh, in my view, there are, there are, there are about four. Uh, I guess <clears throat> the, the largest one is the language that Fred, uh, Representative Doucette was, talked about in the limiting language, or what, what he referred to as the moratorium. Current law says that with regard to historic horse racing machines, only those facilities that were already licensed and there are 14 of them, can have historic horse racing machines. And that remains the case until July 1 of 2024. After that, anyone operating a charitable gaming facility would be eligible to apply for historic horse racing under the current law. This bill repeals that July 1, 24 date. So it would mean that only the 14 current facilities would continue to be eligible for historic horse racing uh, if that change is made. Now, I would point out that has no effect on how many charitable gaming facilities there are. You could open up a charitable gaming facility tomorrow, 
and offer all the games that are allowed under law with the exception of historic horse racing. You can offer roulette, blackjack, craps, poker, uh, all of those. Uh, and if you're eligible, you if you qualify, you could get a license tomorrow. I would point out that since in the last three years, there has not been a new applicant for a charitable gaming facility, despite the fact that they could. So I think that's important to note. The other major policy change here is the min, uh, maximum uh, wager. Under the current law, the maximum uh, wager uh, that you can bet on blackjack, craps, roulette, is $10. This bill would raise that to 25 It would also raise what's called tournament buy-ins. Buy-in is the amount of money you pay to enter a tournament. Currently, the maximum buy-in allowed under the law is $250. This would raise that to $2,500. Now, that may seem like that may seem like a big leap, and I don't think we're going to see very many $2,500 tournaments in New Hampshire. Um, but I think it's possible that down the road, somebody might want to run like a big tournament once a year or something. But we need the changes in the wager and the tournament to be able to stay competitive with what goes on around us in other states. People can drive to Oxford in Maine or to Encore down in Everett or even Foxwoods, and they can play table games at a much higher rate than the $10 maximum that we have. Uh, one of one of the reasons, or one of the issues that comes up with regard to the charitable gaming facilities relative to the wager <clears throat> is obviously the wager limit limits the revenue to the facility, which limits the amount of money available to pay employees. Now, with all that we know has been going on since COVID and all the issues related to any business getting employees, I can tell you, can represent to you that the pay rate, the pay rates of uh, dealers and other employees, these facilities has risen dramatically just to be able to retain them. And the game operators need to have a wager increase partly to be able to continue to pay the employees the larger uh, wages that they're getting that they were getting versus five years ago. So, um, but it really is about when it comes particularly to the tournaments, it's about competition. Poker players uh, will travel. Uh, you, there are lots of poker forums that you can log into and you read and people talk about they're traveling to New York or they're traveling, you know, they'll drive 100, 200, 300 miles to go to a competitive poker tournament. And that happens throughout New England. And right now we're limited to a max of 250. Uh, we can have one tournament a day at 250. And that just is not competitive with surrounding states. So that's the reason that we need, uh, we're asking for the increase. And I think uh, the third thing is the changing of the licenses from one year to three. And I just point out, I think it was Representative Fellows who asked the question about licensing. Every employee associated with gaming in the facility has to have some kind of a license. So you have a game operator employer, that's the owner. Primary game operators are basically shift supervisors or people who are managerial. And then secondary game operators are the other employees, people who are dealers and that sort of thing, work the cage. But all of them go through a licensing process. Under the current law, they are required to get fingerprinted and a criminal background check every year. This changes that to three every, thir every three years. And we just think that's efficient. Um, it does require that they keep the commission up to date on any changes that affect their licensing. And that's done by filing an annual report uh, and paying the fee they otherwise would have paid. Um, we just think those that change is, will be very helpful. And it's it seems like you know we've got about a thousand employees in charitable gaming, and um, you know right now every single one of them have to go get fingerprinted somewhere and go through a criminal background check every year. We don't think that's necessary. And one final thing I will say is there's a, that I think is a significant policy change in the bill is the current law maxes the bond requirement for the facility at $500,000.
and this bill re- uh, raises that to a million. And we think that's a good change too, particularly with the addition of historic horse racing. So with that, Madam Chair, I would ask for your support of the bill. Happy to answer any questions and work with any subcommittees that you may have. Representative Alwyn. Thank you. Just to clear something up, I think it was Representative Fellows who assumed that uh, the employees were on re- regulated by OLPC, but uh, in this case, it's all lottery, right? That is correct. They're, they are not, they're regulated by the lottery only. Representative Janigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you mentioned that going to $25 would help us be more competitive as a, as a state. Is 25 competitive, or what are other states? Um, actually, two, two parts to that. One is $25 max wager and also the $2,500 you talked about. Are both those numbers competitive with other states? Do they need to be higher, or is that a good number? Most states, uh, in fact, I think all of them have no statutory limit on wagers in their casino. So um, I think the facilities, from what my experience has been, facilities will oftentimes limit. You'll see $500 is typical at, at Foxwoods, for instance, is the maximum wager you can make. So in terms of what are, is 25 competitive with Encore? No, because Encore has unlimited wages. Frankly, I don't think the legislature would give us unlimited wages. We'd certainly like to have it. But so we're trying to move the ball a little as we've done over the past 18 years. Uh, But New Hampshire's approach to gambling is unique in that uh, the question was asked, do other states do it this way? The answer to that is no. Every other state that has uh, what you would call, you know, casino type gambling it's commercial gambling with the no charity component and with unlimited wagers. Representative Ullery and then Ames. Uh, thank you very much. Could you uh, please discuss how you have 14 licenses which would remain the same and would not expand. So is there a competitive market for that? If we were to um, cap the the market at 14, would that limit any future growth of this industry? Or would it lead to what I seem to see taking place, larger corporations buying the license of a smaller charitable gaming operation to conglomerate it into, let's say, a, a residential destination casino? Could you discuss that? I don't think I can answer the second part of your question, but I I would want to clarify. We don't limit the number of charity gaming facilities that can exist in New Hampshire. Right now, you can, we there could potentially be 100, 200, whatever. Anybody can apply. And if you're, if you qualify, you can get a charitable gaming license. Okay. So we do only have 14 right now. The limit that is in place right now is, those are the only 14 places where historic horse racing can take place. Okay, so if you were to open up a charitable gaming uh, operation in Plastow, for instance, uh, you could have all the games that the other rooms have except the HHR machines. Uh, so there is no limit. I would, as I pointed out in my testimony, there has not been a new applicant or a new facility open uh, in the last, and I think probably five years uh which says to me we're at a good spot uh in terms of what the market can bear if there were opportunities for others to make money in it i would assume that people would be opening additional facilities follow up uh thank you um so let's say you have a a moderately sized operation in a one of the, the border cities if it were to move into another bigger facility, it would expand its the number of tables, the number of personnel being employed, the number uh, number of uh, glasses of uh, adult beverages that were being served. Uh, all that would take place 
And if we were to increase the table stakes and the buy-in for poker games, that would attract a larger crowd, would it not? We would hope that would, yes. So to follow up on the point, on that point would be if that is that considered a new facility opening up or are they just taking the license from down here and moving it over there under the current law a facility one of the 14 facilities could do exactly what you just said they could move uh for the purposes of having historic horse racing they could move from one location to another within the same community Okay, so yes, in that sense, it would be moving that license from Main Street to F Street, if that were the case. And trying to think if anybody's done it. Um, to my knowledge, nobody has done it yet, but they are working on it in Lebanon and they are working on it in Salem. And Nashua. You're absolutely right. They're, they did do it. The, the river moved to a facility now called the Lucky Moose in Nashua. Yes. Okay, Representative Ames had a question, I think. You had a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, this may be too broad, but um, I received this in the mail, which is presumably from you, um, just yesterday as I came home from a long day at the legislature. Um, this is uh, this is from the New Hampshire Charitable Gaming Operators Association, which is, I think, your that's correct. What you're representing, um, and it's an impressive document. Oh, it has your name on the back, um, and uh, um, so my that's a backdrop. Uh, I suppose a side question is: Did you mail it to everybody sitting here? It was that was mailed to all members of the House and Senate. Okay, good. Um, this is the broad question. How are you doing? How's business uh, for your casinos? Are you booming? Are you struggling because you need uh, your, there are too many uh, limitations on what you do? You've got uh, Massachusetts, um, you know, pushing its casinos, its big encore casino is, uh, is I don't know how it's doing post uh, COVID, but now it's post COVID and so probably more activity there. Uh, Massachusetts has gotten into sports gaming, which I know is not directly charitable gaming, but the latest model has, like the Brook, has a sports book right there, and so it's uh, it's part of the deal and part of the attraction. How how are we doing with uh, this? Well, it, it is a mixed bag. I will tell you the facilities that have opened up historic horse racing, which I think are just about half of them, maybe a couple, maybe one or two more than half. Um, they're doing th those those machines are doing well and generating good revenue. They're bringing facilities that in the past were not making money to be profitable. Um, we do see you mentioned the post COVID world, particularly in Massachusetts. Now there for a long time, Massachusetts casinos were not doing poker. Poker is a very important part of of the casino environment, and since they weren't doing it, that was benefiting rooms in New Hampshire. They are now aggressively getting back into poker, which is why we're asking for the tournament uh, and the wager increase, frankly, but the tournament uh, increase because we want to be able to be competitive with with them. We, we need that increase in order to do that. Um, so that has affected the border. You can see the numbers have dropped a little, and I anticipate they will drop a little more on the border uh, casinos, charity casinos in, in particular, because of the poker uh, marketing that uh, Encore and others down in Massachusetts are doing. Overall, I will tell you that five years ago, there were probably, I would say at least half of the charity gaming rooms were either breaking even or not making a profit. And I believe that today, I could say that they're probably all making a profit. Some small, because they don't have a HHR yet, but, uh, but HHR has certainly helped those that have it. One follow-up. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned one of the, one of the uh, parts, changes made in this bill, raising the um, bet limit and um, the 
buy-in uh, number for um, poker, um, if I've got the right word, I don't know, um, is partly a response to competition in Massachusetts. And um, my question is whether there, whether we should be worried, and as you might be, about uh, the potential for higher limits affecting problem gaming. Affecting problem gaming, is that what you asked? Yeah. So I really am not. You're at a higher level of money uh, and uh, interest, perhaps, and attraction to the game. So the, the only thing I would say is, I mean, I'm, I'm not qualified, really, to know if, if bigger limits would mean people would, would problem game, would bet more, because they have to have the money to bet. But I would point out that, for instance, in sports betting in New Hampshire, there's no limit on how much you can bet on sports betting. And, you know, you see the ads of watching the Super Bowl, all you see are ads for places to bet on, on sports, and you can bet on, you know, who's going to catch the next pass and all that sort of thing. And that's going on in New Hampshire today. I, I honestly believe, uh, it's not my bias because I represent charity gaming, uh, I honestly believe sports betting presents a much bigger problem, potential problem for problem gaming than what you see in a, a casino environment. Oh, thank you for that insight. Thank you. Uh, Representative Malloy and then Representative Ors. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. This is kind of a follow-up on what Representative Ames, I think, was working toward. But my question is more direct. What would change? How would unlimited wagers in New Hampshire change our charitable gaming business model here. You mentioned earlier that you think the legislature would approve that, may not, but I'm just curious to know how it would, if it did, if we did, how would it change charitable gaming here in New Hampshire, revenue and all that? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So whether you increase it to $25 or some other number, the, the biggest change is people tend to go out in groups, right? We don't, I mean, most of us, we have friends, we have family you go out with. I would say that a, a vast number of people who bet in casinos want to be at a $10 or $5 table, but there are some that want to be at a higher table. Now, if we're going out with four or five of us together, and you know, I, I want to be at a $25 blackjack table, and you're happy with a $5 table, then all five of us are going to probably end up going somewhere where we, where we can all get what we want. So we lose that business. We end up going to Encore instead of stopping in Nashua or Salem. Okay, uh, it's and so so raising the stake to any level keeps some of that business, whatever that limit's going to be, will keep some of that business right here in New Hampshire. One of the things we find is that yes, Encore is a beautiful facility, but the facilities that we have are also very well done. And the fact that they're smaller, they're, they are attractive to some players. They don't want to go through the, you know, the, you need a shuttle to get through the parking lot and, and, you know, deal with all of the hubbub that happens down at a big casino. So stopping at the Brook or stopping in Salem makes sense to them. But having that larger bet will mean more of them will be taking, will, making that stop instead of continuing to the next state. So I think that's the way, that's the biggest change. It will get us, make us more competitive to keep more of the customers here in New Hampshire. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question. So why is the sports betting a problem? You mentioned the next pass, the whatever. What's the problem with that? No, I, I was only saying that in terms of the question regarding problem gaming, which I am not an expert on at all, uh, it has just simply been my observation that because you have so many elements, so many ways to bet, you can bet every 30 seconds or so you know, on an online app in sports betting, it would be my opinion, not based on any scientific data, but my opinion that sports betting is more apt to, to, be, a, to be a target of people with problem gaming than a charity casino environment. Okay, very good. Follow-up, please. So you mentioned that 
uh, currently there's these limits on wagers and the charities in the state get 25%. Is that what I heard earlier today? I don't think you said it, but I think I heard it earlier today. So just to be clear on that, on the on table games, whether it's poker or blackjack or craps, the charity gets 35% of the revenue from those tables, and the state gets 10 On historic horse racing, uh, there's 25% of the revenue is comes out. We call it a takeout. And that is split between the state and the charity. The charity gets 35% of that, and the state gets 65% of that. Okay, very good. So here's my question. So what if we were to just take the limits off of everything? What is it you would want, and what would be the increase to our charities in the state? Any idea? Well, if you increase uh, wagers, whether it's to $25 like this bill does or some other number, I will tell you Senate Bill 120 in the Senate, for instance, has passed the Senate once, it has a limit of $50. So that you'll, you'll probably see Senate Bill 120 at some point, I would assume. But what would it do to charity revenue? It would, do, it, it would lift all boats. Yeah, uh, well, my, my point was, what about the percentage? So if we were to give you carte blanche, what would you want that cap to be? Or would we just take the cap off? That's what I'm asking. And then what would the percentages be back to the state and the charities that you think we could get. In other words, I'm saying, like you just said, whatever, you, if you do, if you take the caps off, it's gonna raise all the boats, that's what I'm saying. I wanna raise the money for the state. I don't gamble, I don't care. Uh, how's that, full disclosure. <clears throat> but what I am asking is, if we are to just let you do whatever you wanted to keep the customers, to bring them here, you know, to build a bigger, whatever it is, what is it you would want and what's the what's the payout to the state? I think the uh, thirty five percent from tables and ten percent to the state is a fair uh, division that leaves fifty five percent, regardless of what the wager increase. Because if the wager increases, that's going to you're going to get more money to the more dollars to the charity and the state. Uh, thirty five and ten has worked. It worked at a two dollar bet. It's working at a ten dollar bet. It would work at a twenty five dollar bet. It would work at a hundred dollar bet. Okay, so would you be in favor of taking the caps off? Just take the caps off. Right. I mean, would you be in favor of that? And why or why not? You mean take the caps off the wagers? Yeah, Of everything. course. For sure we would. Okay. We would be in favor of that. Okay. I Thank don't you. think that's viable, but I but I, we'd certainly be in favor of it. I'm in favor of it. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank <laughs> you very much. Representative Almi is who I saw first, and then we'll go over there. Thank you. I've got two questions, so I'll just ask one now. On um, what is the maximum bet on the historic horse racing machines now? Yep. And are what you is the maximum? To change it? Yes. Uh, Twenty-five dollars is the maximum bet, and this bill would not change that. And that can be done every five seconds. I think it could potentially. Yes. I don't think it's practical, but yes. Right. My other questions related, but I'll wait. Okay, Representative Fellows. Thank you. I, I just wanted clarification on the t when you say from the table games, 35% goes to charity and 10% goes to the state of 35 and 10% of what? It's not the bet. It <clears throat> can't be that much. That's so. a very good question, Representative. Uh, thank you. 35% uh, of what we call in the business gross gaming revenue Gross gaming revenue is the money left over after prizes are paid. So basically, it would be it also would be called house win, what the house won on that particular table. Is there some sort of percentage that you can tell us related to the bets that are going down, which max, which the max is twenty five? What? I'm sorry, I don't what? understand the question. So what does the gross gaming revenue, what percent is that usually of a bet? Well, that's very difficult to say on a table game because there actually are days when a house can lose, right? I mean, you could have somebody get hot on the roulette wheel or on a crap table, and at the end of the day, the house ends up with a negative number. There is no house win. So some days you can win some. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. It's, 
it's very difficult. Unlike, for instance, historic horse racing, where, as Representative Ames pointed out, the the absolute maximum house win is going to be 12% of the bets. You really can't put a number on the table games like that. It's going to be, it's going to vary from time to time. But if you'll, if you will let me say this with the caveat that please don't hold me to it, I will tell you that I think most people in the industry would say that something between 15 and 20 percent is about what you can anticipate the house win to be over the long term. Representative Leapley. Thank you. Um, thanks for taking my question. Thank you for your very cogent kind of breakdown of what we're talking about with the four points. That helped me a lot. Um, I have two questions. One is when I volunteer in my school, my child's school, I have to get fingerprinted. So it, my question is why would you not want your employees fingerprinted every year? Um, because it seems like professionally it's their job to work in gambling and to handle lots of money. Um, is it really such a big inconvenience? You know, it's not a, it's not a game stopper or game changer, but um, we think that, I mean, first of all, and the lottery would know this more than I, but I think I would know if we'd ever found an employee getting fingerprinted for renewal that turned up something that ended up getting them denied a license, right? Employees know that, I mean, if an employee knows they broke the law and they've done something bad, in all likelihood, they're going to not come back because they know they're going to get picked up. They're going to, it's going to get caught. So, so it seems, I guess our position is on that point that it's just redundant that it has to happen every single year and it, it costs the employee money and it costs time and it's, it's inconvenient. Right. It's not something that we would say is essential to the legislation, but it would certainly be more convenient. Representative Platt. Have you placed odds on the passage of this bill? <laughs> I'm not a bookie. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, related to the other question, um, there are charitable gaming places that um, put more emphasis on the machines, and there are charitable gaming places that put more emphasis, it looks like, on poker and other table games. And um, in Lebanon, there is a small place that most people didn't even know was there, on, which is in the middle of a area of subsidized housing, uh, who are people that would just go to machines usually. Is there a question here? And, and it's moving to a place okay. that is next to uh, our major thrift store uh, and the cheapest supermarket. So um, it seems to be that as an example. Uh, and then the brook seems to be heavily oriented towards getting people in for uh, the other games. Is there a question there, please? The question was, uh, how many of these, uh, I think there are only eight now with with the machines? I, I think that may be right. The, it does change. there the, six it, that don't even have this question yet. But of the ones that have the machines, how many of them are, are um, pushing, are getting more revenue out of the machines than they are out of the other games or vice versa? Are you asking, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I'm not clear on the question. On their um, business models, are they uh, pushing to, are they making more money out of these historic horse racing machines or are they making more money out of the, the other games? Or are they trying to make more money? Well, I, th I, I think obviously they try to maximize revenue any way they can. But I would point out that in the rules that were adopted, mm -hmm. 
the uh, facility has to have a ratio of revenue from uh, table games that, uh, t versus revenue from machines. Oh, it does? And I think it's um, 6.33. Uh, it's a factor of 6. Point th so the revenue for HHR machines uh, cannot exceed, I think it's 6.33 percent, uh, 6.33 times the revenue from table games. And if it does, the, the rate goes up from 25% to 50 percent okay the, the so that's a dramatic the, increase in the rate of what the rate of the takeout so the the charity money goes charity actually ends up getting another 25 percent if it exceeds that ratio okay so it's six and a third times the the amount coming out of the table games correct that's pretty high level Questions, yes, Representative Leapley. Quick one. Um, the speaker has indicated he's not a specialist on problem gaming and understand that. I'm wondering if the committee could invite someone who could help us understand, um, because when we talk about tobacco or alcohol, we know there's a cost to society, right, um, of problem uses of that. And there would be a, pro a cost to society of the problem um, gambling. And I'm wondering if, um, and this would be bigger, it wouldn't just be the charity gambling, but it would be, I wonder if the Lottery Commission would be who we could ask. Yeah, because obviously there's a lot economic... of uh, be, charitable gaming is one element of what the Lottery Commission does, but they also do scratch tickets and probably other things I don't right. even know about. So I think we'll have to ask them when they return to help us understand that piece. I just want to make sure that if we're capturing revenue, are we accounting for any cost? I and do think we know there the is a special fund maybe for that, and they would know that. The, so we'll ask them. Thank I, you. I can tell you that with the passage of House Bill 626 two years ago that authorized historic horse racing, um, there is money that it's called breakage. Breakage is the leftover pennies that, are, that accumulate uh, in uh, paramutual wagering, and that money goes... To, prob to the Problem Gaming Fund. And I can say, just to give you an idea, I mean, not, again, not everybody up and running yet, but I believe that's averaging somewhere around $11,000 a month. The last I saw it, it's probably growing as more and more historic racing machines come online. And just to clarify, my question is not just what revenue we're capturing, which that's really helpful, but also if there's some way that the state is quantifying a cost. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a few more people who are going to testify on this bill too, so we might be able to ask them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, we will now recognize Tina Andrade uh, from the Home Health and Hospice Care. Good morning and thank you so much Welcome. for allowing me to speak. And I'd like to offer another perspective, if I may. And I'm um, the Director of Philanthropy for Home Health and Hospice Care and the Community Hospice House. And we were one of the first organizations, the charitable uh, nonprofits, to take advantage of <clears throat> charitable gaming. And I would say that last year, um, we received a check for our week that was about $71,000. And I'd like to let you know what we did with that money. So we're an old organization. We were founded in 1883, still going strong. We serve 25 cities and towns in southern New Hampshire, and on any day, we probably have about 500 patients. Most of them are cared for in the home setting. So we have about 250 clinicians, and they're driving all over New Hampshire and, and going up to people's doors and helping those folks stay independent in their homes. In addition to that, we do hospice care in nursing homes, in people's homes, and in the community hospice house, where we have a 10 suite, 10 beds, where we take care of folks at end of life 
who for whatever reason, and there are a couple of different reasons, they cannot be cared for in the home setting. It has been our mission since 1883 to care for people whatever their financial circumstances are. And that means if a person has no insurance, has no resources, we try very desperately to care for them nonetheless. And that includes in the community hospice house. Now, I think I should let you know that there are only two hospice houses in the whole state of New Hampshire. We're one of them. And both of them are nonprofit organizations. We do have <clears throat> for-profit hospices, but they don't have hospice houses anywhere, not in New Hampshire, not across the country. And the reason for that is because hospice houses run at a deficit. So the rest of our business in the home setting, and that's why we're still here today, is because, yes, that does bring in a revenue to support that work. The hospice house does not. And in fact, even when you have Medicare or private insurance or your own resources, every day that a patient is in there, we lose probably about a little over $400 a day. And that's why we have a philanthropy department. And so in a number of different ways, we raise money. We're a little department, just four of us. And we raise money through events, through direct mail solicitations, uh, through memorial gifts, and through grants. And now the brilliance of the state of New Hampshire in bringing us charitable gaming in little community casinos. So when we get that wonderful last year, $71,000, what that meant very directly is several patients dying in the community hospice house. I don't know if any of you have had an experience with someone in hospice or in a community hospice house, but I have to say that every single day, there are notes that come to my desk in the mail, sometimes with a $5 gift, sometimes with a $50 gift, but always, always with something that someone wrote about their experience. And what amazes me is that despite great sorrow in the loss of a loved one, the way people express it is it was the most beautiful experience for us. I got a letter recently from a woman whose family member had died four years ago in the hospice house. And she retold in the letter what an incredible experience it was for them. And she wrote, at the time, my sisters and I didn't realize it. You were taking such wonderful care of our dad. We didn't realize it, but you were also taking great care of us. So I think it's important in the big perspective, you know, to know what our charities are doing and how absolutely important this is to us. If we didn't have the hospice house, people would die anyway but they may die in a hospital setting, much more expensive, both for families, for insurance, for the state of New Hampshire, and for communities. And taking up a bed that someone who may go into the hospital and recuperate would be able to have. So <clears throat> in terms of this bill, we now have the historic horse racing machines. My organization's week starts next Monday. And we are so grateful to be able to do this because we know it will directly affect people in our community, directly affect them. 
now that we have historic horse racing machines, <clears throat> there now are two charities a week that would be um, that would receive the gift. Two charities a week. So I know that this this next week um, we will receive a charitable gift. It won't be quite as much. So when we talk about raising the bet that a person can make, we know lots of people won't go up to the $25 because people just don't. They know what their limits are. These are small places. They're community places. There's one 10 minutes away from my own house that I've certainly been at and see everybody I know. You know, it's just, it's a safe place. People are having fun, and most of the bets will be small bets. But it would be wonderful to be able to be back at that level that we were before. Because for us, that is just, I can see patience. A woman came up to me at a Rotary meeting on Monday, and she had a story, and she was saying that she had a friend that needed hospice help, but they didn't have any insurance. What could we do about it? And I said, please, let us know. Have the doctor refer that patient. You know, that's exactly why we are a nonprofit organization. Because whether you're a prince or a pauper, you would get the same exact care at the community hospice house. And the, this particular bill will just simply make it possible for someone else like that um, to have their last few days in a place like ours. And so I urge you today uh, to consider this perspective. I know you've spent a lot of time today talking about the ins and outs of it as you should without any question, but New Hampshire has done a brilliant thing than most other states have done. I know you're going to hear from a couple other nonprofits um, today, but I just want you to see very clearly what this is doing, and it's a good thing. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, sir. For the record, I just want to say, um, what you do is amazing. Thank you. I've experienced it personally, so thank you. Representative Platt. Yes, I have. Take my composure for a moment. Um, is there a limit to how often you can come uh, to the, uh, the gaming association? Yes, only uh, once a week. Uh, we get one week in a year. Oh, could I? I forgot. I'm sorry, getting a little older. Um, I wanted to address the fingerprinting briefly because I have firsthand experience. So the first year, I knew I was the one that would pick up the check. So I went down to the police station, you know, and I did the digital, and they sent it up to wherever they send it. I think that they send it to the FBI. But at any rate, it came back that they couldn't read it. So I went back to the police station, and they did it with ink. And we did, the, we sent it off, and they called me up and said, sorry, you seem to have no fingerprints. <laughs> and I thought, oh, perhaps I should have been a cat burglar. But at any rate, then we went, and I had another person in my office go. She called the National Police Department and said, could I come this afternoon? And they said, oh, no, we just brought a whole bunch of criminals in, so don't come today. The next time I got another person in our office, the director of home care, Lucy. And Lucy went to the police station. Same problem. Lucy and I decided, she had no fingerprints. So Lucy and I decided, this probably because we have Raynaud's, you know, not, our fingers are always cold. At any rate, what I do want to say about this is I think it's actually probably taxing on the police department, although they have to speak for themselves. Um, but in our organization, you know, we have criminal records checks done every single year on every employee because we work with people in the community. And so just something to think about. I suspect 
that our fellow nonprofits probably do the same thing. Now, I'm sorry, you did have questions. Other questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, we have a card from Kevin Jordan. <laughs> Sorry, it took me a minute to read your first name. I should have recognized you. Apologies. From the New Hampshire Law Enforcement Memorial Commission? Association. Association. Yes. Thank yes, you. Thank you. That's who I'm representing today. Okay. Um, that's why I'm in plain clothes, actually. In the, my real life, I'm the chief of law enforcement in New Hampshire Fish and Game. So, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate all of the members of the House Ways and Means Committee. I've learned a great deal sitting here today, a lot that I did not know about gambling. I'm not a gambler. I lost $50 many years ago in Las Vegas, and it bothers me to this day. Um, so I don't do that, but I have, as a result of my charity, uh, we have benefited from uh, the um, monies that come in to New Hampshire for uh, under charity gaming. So the Law Enforcement Memorial Association was created many years ago to recognize and memorialize the ultimate sacrifices made by the men and women who have lost their lives while protecting New Hampshire citizens. The association also recognizes those sacrifices made by the family and friends survivors of these New Hampshire heroes. Each year during the month of May, uh, out here on the front lawn, as most of you know, we hold a ceremony uh, during Law Enforcement Week to honor those sacrifices and to memorialize those officers. As a nonprofit, uh, which we are, our greatest challenge has always been fundraising. We don't receive any state funding for this organization. We operate solely based upon uh, donations. The cost to hold these annual ceremonies during Police Week each year continues to increase, and the, currently the cost for this event alone nears $7,000 annually. Uh, we put the flowers in and maintain the memorial grounds out here as well each year. So a few years ago, we, quite by luck, were offered the opportunity to participate in the charitable gaming, uh, and that was my first exposure to that. And we partnered up with Boston Billiards in Nashua, New Hampshire, through this young lady sitting behind me, Gia. Uh, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that certainly saved our organization. Um, we no longer have to struggle to get enough donations to maintain the memorial or the grounds surrounding that site out front here. We've been able to meet the cost of conducting an annual ceremony for the families. We do support the change uh, in this bill and the increase in the ability to place bets from the current $10 to a $25 limit. Uh, one of the concerns I had when I, when I asked about this change was the fact that there are New Hampshire citizens, or quite possibly New Hampshire citizens, that are leaving our state to spend this money in other states. Uh, to me, that makes no sense. I would like to see uh, the state New Hampshire economy benefit from that. It seems like a modest change to me. Um, I think it's important for us to promote our own economy and encourage those people to place those bets here in New Hampshire. It will not only help our economy, it will benefit the very valuable nonprofits that, that also benefit from this charity gaming. I would like to echo the, the concerns or the, or the praise, really, for the legislature to take, you, you know, sitting here, I'm watching this, and you're taking very careful contemplation of all of this. And I appreciate that as a citizen. I think it's important to me. I have mixed, I've always had mixed feelings about gambling. Um, but I've also had an opportunity now to see the benefits from it uh, when it's controlled and managed. And I believe that you folks are doing a very good job trying to do that. So I, I give you a lot of credit for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to speak to was the fingerprint requirement that happens. So every year I go down at the end of the year to get w when we have our week and I have to pick up the check uh, that comes to the law enforcement memorial and I have to be fingerprinted. And I thought being in this field that I'm in and have been in for three decades would exempt me from that. It does not. I have to get fingerprinted uh, and have my background checked. The one thing I would, and so when, they, when I saw in the bill that this was going to change, it kind of made sense to me. I do share concerns brought out this morning about, you know, are we concerned about people, um, you know, getting into trouble? And I guess I would say this for you to consider or ask you to consider this. In the law enforcement field, when I signed up to be a police officer some 32 years ago, I had my background done, my fingerprints were taken, and my criminal background was checked. As I sit here 32 years later, it's never been done again, with the exception of the time when I go down to Boston Billiards to get my check for my nonprofit. So, we're allowing guys who carry guys and gals who carry guns and have the rights to take away people's rights, frankly. Uh, 
we're not requiring them to be checked every year. So I would think that this would be safe to do in this field, is my opinion. I am concerned about, uh, and, I, and I've learned more today than I've ever known about the HHR machines. Um, the only concern, and, and Boston Billiards has moved to that, and we've been told that we're going to be sharing a week with another charity. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, the, the money that we get certainly uh, is sufficient to run it to run our program. I am concerned if this were to open up statewide and we would dilute that opportunity that the charities would then suffer. Um, so I am very much in favor of limiting that. I think that's important uh, to consider when you're making your decision. Um, and I don't, most of everything else that I had written down here has already been discussed. So I don't want to um, take up any more of your time, but I would respectfully ask you to consider carefully as you're doing from sitting back here watching it and listening to it that you support House Bill 607 as we move forward. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Platt. Are, are you aware if there's a central repository for fingerprints? There is, yes. So those are main, those are not thrown away. They are maintained by the FBI. So your prints would go to the FBI. They would go through safety, Department of Safety, and then to the FBI for, for analysis or checking. Yes. Follow up, please. If so, why do we require fingerprinting at all if there are already fingerprints on file? Well, that, that, is, that is my question, I guess. Although not everyone has, I guess, arguably, not everyone in the world has been fingerprinted. Um, you know, unless they've they've been required to under a certain, but once that occurs, uh, there's no value to, to redoing that other than checking a background, rather checking a criminal record. I will say that anyone convicted of a misdemeanor or above crime doesn't do that quietly. It, it hits the newspapers and that's not something that you can keep quiet. Representative Britton. So maybe it's in the, in, oh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, but maybe it's in the legislation, but um, regarding the benefit that's paid to a nonprofit yes. or a chair. Now, does a nonprofit have to be in the municipality that a gaming building is or? It oh. does not. No, the requirements for a nonprofit must be that you must be a, a nonprofit in good standing. So you must be registered with the state. You must be registered with charitable trust. You have to produce and you have to have the IRS uh, standard or meet that standard. And all of that paperwork is required to be filed each year uh, with the uh, gaming um, institution that's going to contribute to you. But there's not a requirement for you to be in that area. For instance, Law Enforcement Memorial is housed out of Concord. And, and we receive generous donations from Nashua, from Boston Billiards. Got a follow-up? So follow-up, and then Representative Platt has a follow-up. So is it realistic to think that um, myself, who is an executive director of uh, Transport Central, nonprofit up in Plymouth, might be able to apply for something like this? Yes, I would say that it is, yes. The other thing I, I just want to add, and, and maybe a lot of you know that, I didn't have a very, in law enforcement, I have a very good feeling about gambling casinos based on my training and experience. I will tell you that opinion changed when I spent some time, and I can only speak to Boston Billiards, and I'm not here to promote Boston Billiards, but it's the one I'm familiar with. I went in there, it's a very professionally run organization. Um, I watched the balance and checks from a corner, uh, and, it's, and it's run the way I would expect it to be run, and I, I left there much more confident about gaming uh, and the way New Hampshire controls it than I ever had prior to that. So just something for you to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Just a statement. I know firsthand that it used to be you have to be a 501c3. That's changed to a 501c4 can now also apply. Yes, I know a 501c3 can. I'm not familiar with the four. Yeah. When we do the work session, we can drill down yes. on that unless uh, you would like to fill out a PIN card. But we're going to do a follow-up work session. Thank you very much Thank for your you testimony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And we will make sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have a question over here? Oh, Representative Ellery, I apologize. Yes, sir. Just to switch hats a second. To yes, sir. You're a, a law enforcement officer in Fish and Game. Is that I right? am. Yes, sir. Now, just a little bit on background checks. Yes. Somebody gets employed. With a law enforcement agency. Yes. Do they do the FBI check or do they just do the state police check, both of which are considered background checks? Right. 
And if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, the state police check is only a record not of arrests, but only of convictions that appear on the state police form. It doesn't talk about arrests. It doesn't talk about court appearances. It only talks about convictions. That So you're correct on a couple of different levels. So state law enforcement agencies do a... Uh, mind-boggling background it's a complete background to include fbi records fbi numbers if one exists um we go back we my agency we go to the elementary school where the officer attended school and we start there and work our way up so those are pretty complete at the state level and most most cities now i believe with LEAC, with the implication of the LEAC commission most cities i think are now doing that as well you would be correct the state if you were to run my background at New Hampshire State Police or Department of Safety, you would find only convictions that have occurred in the state of New Hampshire. You would not find, for instance, I just ran an individual um, uh, who is going to be applying for a guides license. And in New Hampshire, his record was clear, and we found his record was certainly not clear when we left the state and went to other states. called a triple I uh, investigation. So you would be accurate. Follow-up. Follow-up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is for information, I believe. Um, I'm also aware that private investigators have both a FBI check, yes. the triple I check, and they also check with the RCMP um, because of the type of activities in which they're engaged. Sure. And I believe some of the youth activities uh, also require a multiple state check yes. uh, because of the uh, chance for child abuse. But the term background check, as it otherwise appears in law, only applies to the sur uh, surface check that is done by the New Hampshire State Police. Is that more or less a correct analysis? Or New England? Yes, yes. That's a that's a pretty good analysis. Yes, that's a that's a uh, very general term. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, do we have any more questions over here? Thank you so Thank much you for your testimony. Much. Okay, the chair will recognize John Ericazo from Meals on Wheels of Hillsborough County. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to, the, to the chair representatives for having me here. So I'm the chairman, or excuse me, I'm the president and CEO of Meals on Wheels of Hillsborough County. We're an essential service. We're a beneficiary of charitable gaming. Uh, God bless charitable gaming. They have uh, saved us more than once. Uh, the um, couple things I'll say briefly are that um, the crim criminal checks, I've been in human services ser serving vulnerable populations for more than 40 years. I've had background checks. I've had criminal checks galore. First time I've been fingerprinted was for charitable gaming, and now I have to do it every year. So I'd love to not do it. It's, it's a nightmare having to do it. Um, and sharing of days because the uh, charitable gaming now has to be shared by two charities our our um, benefits from charitable gaming have been reduced considerably so anything you can do to bolster charitable gaming is great uh, raising the bet limit is wonderful taking the bet limit away i don't know whatever you need to do to help charitable gaming uh, is a really great thing. And Representative Ames, you had asked how uh, the charitable gaming outfits were doing, and that was a really great question. I'm here to say, how are the charities doing? Um, we're struggling with inflation, energy costs. For me, food costs, meals on wheels. I got to pay more for gas and food. I've got to. I raise a million dollars a year. I've got to figure out how to raise a million two next year because of of the costs. So whatever you can do to help with charitable gaming, it benefits our charities. It would be most appreciated. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your testimony. Other questions? People might be getting hungry for lunch. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I do not have any more pink cards. Is there anyone else here who would like to say something? No. Okay, we will now close the public hearing on House Bill 607, and we will schedule a work session, which will be noticed in the calendar for everyone. Please come back. <coughs> yeah.
Yeah, we have until 1.15, so you have about 40 minutes to take a lunch break, and uh, then please come back. We all have public hearings starting at 1.15. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much. I'm Representative Timothy Horry from Stratford County District 10, which uh, has no cigar shops in it, although we're right next to uh, Dover, which does have a federal cigar shop. Um, and uh, so actually probably most of you know this already, but uh, what is a premium cigar? So I'm just saying, and there's a more precise definition, but those are those big cigars which are wrapped by hand in tobacco leaves rather than uh, wrapped by a machine in paper. You, they're much more expensive than cigarettes, little cigars, or regular cigars. And uh, premium cigars are not taxed at all at the state level here in New Hampshire. They're subject only to a minimal federal excise tax of 40.26 cents per cigar for a product which typically sells for 5 or $10 or even uh, more than that, sometimes much more than that. So, and... Uh, so what this bill does, it, it eliminates the legal distinction in the RSAs between premium cigars and other cigars. So it deletes the definition of premium cigar from RSA 78.1, deletes two other references in RSA 78, which was totally recodified in 2020. And actually one of the reasons, this is a perennial bill, but one of the reasons I haven't bothered to do it in a couple of legislative seasons, um, well, aside from the fact that... Uh, um, aside from the fact that so far it hasn't gone far, but the committee is certainly free to change its mind this time around. Um, also, um, just in 20 and 21, things were kind of not really normal, so this uh, didn't seem like this seemed like just didn't seem like uh, I guess I wanted to limit the number of bills I was introducing, the amount of burden I put on the legislative process. But this year I went ahead and put it in, and here I am again. So the net effect of that change, of that change, the leading the specific uh, definition of premium cigars um, is that all uh, it, it we tax the same rate as all other cigars and 60, a tobacco products at a rate of 65.03% of the wholesale price. And that's 65% of the wholesale price, not the retail price. From my seeing premium cigars, like most other consumer goods, are marked up about 100% when, when retailed. And, uh, and then backing up a little bit, the history of tobacco rate Tax rate changes in little indicates that demand for tobacco is relatively price inelastic. When the price goes up for whatever reason, demand goes down uh, just a little. So my opinion is HB 510 will lead to, well, a lot more tax, tobacco tax revenue. Or well, actually, it's probably um, going to be in the order of about a million dollars. So I guess we can debate whether or not that's a lot of money. Um, along with a little bit less tobacco consumption, and those are both desirable results. And uh, I see a couple of the opponents of the bills. I remember the the last four hearings we've had on them, and uh, and they claim it would st drive the state cigar buyers out of business because the cigar aficionados are all supposedly all switched to buying cigars online. But there are plenty of cigar bars and cigar stores in other states which do pack uh, premium cigars. Cigars, the product appeals to the senses. At least if an aficionado, I'm kind. Of, I mean. I don't mind smelling them occasionally. I'm not really in that category, but you know, you can't t feel, taste, or smell the cigars on the website or a catalog. They're also much more enjoyable when shared with other cigar aficionados. I, parenthetically, I, I've noticed looking at the websites of the various uh, cigar uh, retailers in New Hampshire, they all really, a lot of them play up the uh, relation, the idea that you can form of a relationship with the staffs to talk a lot about the personalities of the staffs, even the people who make them. Um, so, you know, especially there's a gentleman, there's a gentleman in here who's going to come in and disagree with everything I say, but uh, his his website uh, talks all about himself and his employers. And certainly, uh, I guess if you like cigars, they're probably fun people to buy the cigars from. So, and it's a uh, so, so there's a very social aspect to a cigar smoking, and they're expensive and unhealthy. Maybe not as unhealthy as cigarettes, but they're still not good, or vaping, but they're still not as good for you. So my opinion, my take on it is that, like, yes, yeah, cigar aficionados, they avoid avoiding taxes and getting a good bargain like everyone else. But even the absence of a state line, first of all, if you're a really bottom line oriented person, if not paying taxes, if saving money is what you really care about, that's really not the product for you. Cigar smoking is not really the bad habit the, or the hobby, whatever you want to call it for you. So it's, uh, and um, so actually my opinion is probably, my opinion is the uh, market will be relatively unaf unaffected if we impose a tax on them, um, whether or not. 
Specific language, creating this tax exemption was added to the RSAs in 2009, the first year I was in the legislature as part of the budget trailer bill. And frankly, I'm not quite sure what the rationale for the, for the exemption was. It may just, I think it was just one of those things that gets put in during the budget process. And we're not quite sure. Sometimes you're not quite sure where these things come from. It does harken back to the days when New Hampshire was a major manufacturer of cigars. Um, one of the, actually the biggest and most famous cigar factories in the USA was the R.G. Sullivan 7-20-4 factory located in the heart of downtown Manchester. The building is still standing. It still has the R.G. Sullivan cigar sign on it. Um, but that era ended, well, at some point in the middle of the last century, probably like really almost 100, 100 years ago. So... Uh, as far as you can tell, there's no cigars manufactured here in the in the uh, New Hampshire. There's a fairly limited number of uh, cigar bars and cigar stores. Um, it's hard. Some of them are near the border, but uh, some of them are some distance from the border. And of course, the whole population of New Hampshire is concentrated along the border with Massachusetts. So I think they're all located. Just judging from where they're located and so forth, they're not just getting people um, coming across from Massachusetts to flee the. Uh, cigar tax down there and um as i said there's cigar bars and cigar in uh, in massachusetts um and uh and actually i supported some bills which would make it easier for cigar bars to do business like you know we constantly there's um various things like there's hookah bars which are licensed cigar bars which mostly sell uh non-cigar products and we occasionally think about what food and drink they can sell. So I'm not necessarily, this doesn't affect any of those, but I'm not necessarily against those businesses. I just think, uh, I just think these cigars should be taxed at the same rate of other tobacco products. And I'm uh, obviously not opposed to high tobacco taxes. And um, so I'm confident, so I'm confident the cigar industry in New Hampshire will, uh, it'll, it'll rebound from the imposition of this tax. I'm frankly, I mean, it's, Frankly, I'm not sure if it'll make much difference at all to most of the, the cigar smokers you know, who are, especially the ones who are coming in to enjoy it in a social social setting. So that's, uh, I certainly d don't think everything's going to be driven online. Um, something I should add though is we do have like several cigar retailers who do a good online business. Um, so I don't think, uh, I don't think this bill would, it would, have, would affect that. Um, that element of the industry to to adversely because at least in theory the buyers of cigars, as I understand it, have to pay the tax in the state where the cigars are delivered to. So they're not, at least in theory, they're not avoiding the, the cigar tax. And uh, and you can certainly, I mean, you can certainly, I would certainly view that as a friendly amendment if you wanted to like clarify that we're not taxing cigars that are shipped out of state. But um, so and I also and I thought about adding. Sorry, the exemption for cigars manufactured in New Hampshire, but the two places I, the two companies I found who are manufacturing their own cigars both actually have their plants in Central America, one in Honduras and one in Nicaragua. So they're not, uh, they're not producing the, uh, they're not producing uh, the cigars here in New Hampshire anyway. And one, one last digression here, which is the R.G. Sullivan Company. He was, uh, I think his name was Robert G. Sullivan. He was famous for making one of the best 10 cent cigars, which I think when you account for inflation, would put those cigars back in the premium premium market. But so that's, that's my bill. It's been around the block a few times. And, uh, maybe this time, maybe, uh, maybe this time it'll actually pass. And certainly, I mean, certainly if I didn't introduce it, the chances of it being passed are zero. So I would, uh, <laughs> I guess I'd be happy to take any questions. looks okay, like great. there may be some. Representative Platt has a question. Yes. Thank you. Why do you care? Is it the million dollars you think it might raise, or well, is it health effects, or what? Well, it started out. I was uh, I was more interested in the e-cigarette and vaping tax, because those were also like not being taxed at the same rate as the tobacco products. That's luckily uh, been kind of a uh, that's that's been uh, th that's that's been uh, kind of a uh, resolved. But there's still this thing with the cigars. I'm not sure why the cheap cigars should be taxed and then the expensive ones should not be taxed. If anything, it would make more sense to do it the other way around. But um, so it's just, uh, you know, it's just, and it's just, it's just, you know, it's not really enough to balance the budget budget on. But it just seemed like a, it just seemed like a, uh, just seemed like a discrepancy, or like an oddity in the law that really served no discernible purpose. At least no discernible purpose to anyone who's not in the premium cigar business. So thanks. 
Representative Elberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hargan, um, do you have a sense of what percentage of all tobacco sales uh, is made up of premium cigars? Well, it's fairly small. It's addressed in the the fiscal note. They have they've captured some of the sales, so they they the state knows about all sales of premium cigars that are done through wholesalers who also sell alcohol and or taxable tobacco products, which would, there's what they call other tobacco products, which I guess is mostly snuff and rolling tobacco and then cigarettes and also little cigars, which are basically cigarettes wrapped in brown paper that uh, at with, uh, it was maybe like a more different tobacco than you'd use in a cigarette. So they do capture those and uh, the figures there in your fiscal note and I haven't memorized the exact number, but well, it's assuming this is the right bill, it is. Um, so you know the wholesale value of premium cigars sold through licensed wholesalers once you sell other products you need a license for is $1,487,549. And then there's some unknown amount, which are wholesalers who deal only in premium cigars. And I'm not, uh, at least some of the, some of the tobacco premium cigar retailers they look to seem to be also be selling uh, other products there and some aren't but so it's uh and if you if you if you do the math and assume no effect whatsoever on demand they came up with a gain of nine hundred sixty seven thousand dollars i'm sure there'd be some reduction in demand but then there's also like all the uh non-licensed wholesalers you're selling premium cigars that's where i figure it's about a million dollars more you know just doing a very rough you, back of the envelope calculation. So. Representative Almy has a question. Thank you. Were you aware that on the only reason that we know how much tobacco gets sold, uh, cigarettes get sold in this state, is because of the tobacco settlement? And that there is a requirement in the tobacco settlement that the... Um, the sellers uh, send lists of who has bought from out of their state to the state where they are buying. I was, I was not not aware of it in the great detail that you are, but uh, yes, I'm 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 sure you're right, and I'm yeah. not disputing. And that does not include cigars. That uh, thank you. Or yes, or other it does. tobacco products. Other questions. Seeing none, thank you for your time. Oh, I apologize. There you are, Representative Ors. Thank you for taking my question, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Representative. So I'm looking at the health statistics you've provided. It seems to be very low-risk product. And I'm looking at all the times you submitted the bill. It looks like you've taken a pretty good butt whooping on that. Uh, we just heard from the uh, Gaming Commission that we are losing a lot of charitable money to Massachusetts because of the way we set fees and that kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't sound like you've done your homework in terms of what was just Representative, uh, I'll stop you there. This is a question, not questioning any motives. We are actually uh, yes. questioning the factual stuff in the bill. I'm such a rookie. <laughs> yeah, so we don't we have we never question motives or that kind of thing. Uh, but if you have a technical question about the intent of the bill, please ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, I'm going to get there eventually, I guess. So I noticed that most of the cigar bars or whatever they're called are along the border. So my concern is that we're going to lose this business to Massachusetts. Are, do you have you done any studies at all? to uh, determine whether or not we are, I mean, you had an opinion, you had, but have you actually done any studies? Well, the, the anecdote we heard, and I think the gentleman I heard the anecdote from is probably gonna get up and testify after me, so he'll have his version of the story, is that there's one well-known cigar retailer and mail order retailer here who um, he'd been fighting with the state of Massachusetts over their tax, and then he picked up and moved the whole business to, to New Hampshire, and I guess actually turns out the locations, he sold his locations in uh, Massachusetts, and I don't see any evidence that they stopped operating as cigar bars, but uh, I mean, people, there may be some, I will say we're, this is, these are subjects for other bills, but uh, we are way behind, Mass well, we're extremely behind in cannabis. We have no legal cannabis sales whatsoever in New Hampshire, whereas Massachusetts has a thriving cannabis industry, and um, 
terms of gaming, you know, they're they're ahead of us too. You know, they have uh, they have that nice, beautiful new Wind Casino in Everett. I apologize. But, Can yeah. we refocus this conversation yeah, yeah. on <laughs> premium cigars? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, I'm not too con- I'm not too concerned. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if there's. I think I'm not sure if there's much of a price war over the border as people people think. And uh, okay, thank you. I mean, you. if they if they lower their if we raise and they lower their price, there may be some effect. But uh, I don't haven't haven't studied it in detail. I mean, what I heard from the industry, of course, is that if we put a tax on this, the whole New Hampshire based industry will evaporate, and that's inconsistent with what I've seen going on in Massachusetts and other states, which do have taxes. But thank you very much. Okay, the chair will recognize Curtis Berry from uh, representing the Cigar Association of New Hampshire. Welcome to Ways and Means. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, I'll apologize to those members of the committee that have been here for a while because this is repetitive. We've heard it all before, as Representative Horrigan mentioned. Um, Representative, I will um, address your question as part of my testimony and I think the, the response that was anticipated by the sponsor is going to be quite different than than what we have uh, to give as an example in reality. Um, first of all, I, I want to address the cigar bar issue um, just to set the stage and, and explain or remind about how the statute works relative to cigar bars. Um, Many of the cigar retailers do not have also a cigar bar license. Some of them do. Among our group, there are probably, I think, five cigar bar licenses of the 13 or 14 or so, maybe more now, locations that I'm here on behalf of. But the statute requires 60% of your revenue to come from the sales of cigars and cigar-related products which means if you don't have the cigar store, the cigar bar goes away by statute, full stop. Um, so to the bill directly, um, in, in, I'll apologize again, uh, Representative Almi reminded me, uh, I left you a packet, but I did not put my business card attached to the packet. It was paper clipped in, in the top sheet, look like this. It is a copy of the statute. So what you don't see in the bill as introduced is very pertinent. This is how the statute defines premium cigar. And one piece that I'll draw your attention to is um, the first one, uh, is made entirely by hand of all natural tobacco leaf. So it's not like other tobacco products where there are flavorings, chemicals, etc. This is 100% leaf tobacco, no stems or anything. Um, that's important for context. Now, there are three states, New Hampshire being one of them, that does not tax what is defined as premium cigars. The other two are Florida and Pennsylvania. Those two states have a very heavy presence of cigar manufacturers there, so their influence is felt. But New Hampshire also has created an industry that sells premium cigars um, in on the next page in, in the packet, which was the map that was referred to earlier, uh, there are a number of locations uh, with stores that are affiliated with our organization. And as you can see, many of them are along the southern border or along I-93. That is not by accident. The sales of premium cigars, I imagine much like the per capita beer sales in the state, are not to New Hampshire's residents because New Hampshire residents are smoke cigars heavier than the rest of the nation. A premium cigar, if stored correctly, will last a very long time, which means the ability to sell to out-of-state customers who come here occasionally, they can load up, put it in a humidor, store it, and enjoy it later on. So what you see is by design. Now, um, one thing about the association I'd like you to keep in mind relative to these locations is we estimate over 100 employees total among these, these retailers. So it, it's a, a small but important part of the economy. Um, the speculation or the assertion that um, stores will not close if you pass the tax is refuted by an actual example. And the truth is, Mr. Dave Garofalo with me today, uh, owns three locations, Seabrook, Nashua, and Salem. 
uh, had several stores in Massachusetts before the mid-90s. And he did fight the tax down there. That is true. And when the state of Massachusetts decided to tax premium cigars, he closed up shop and moved to New Hampshire. And the truth is that at that time, before the tax, there were 30-some-odd cigar stores in the greater Boston area. Today, there's one. One store. That is an actual result of their tax. So what happens when you pass the tax in New Hampshire? A, the vast majority of sales come from out-of-state residents. B, those residents have access to cigars over the internet, also mentioned by the sponsor. So if you're paying the tax, the cost is the same. Are you going to enjoy the convenience of the internet or continue to buy in New Hampshire? We assert the same result will happen in New Hampshire. The stores will close. The cigar bars will close. You will not get the alcohol sales from cigar bars. You will not get the business taxes the state receives from the stores that will close that the state ha enjoys now, to whatever extent it is. Um, that is not speculation. That's the experience and what the cigar store owners tell me will be the result. Um, it's also already been referenced, but the, um, the third document that I've given you is a series of data points on cigar smoking. And this comes from, as the, the notes indicate, National Institutes of Health, FDA. Uh, this is not the cigar industry. One important piece um, that I know is important to some on the committee, uh, on the left column, uh, indicated by the little birthday cake icon, the average age of an individual's first premium cigar is 30 years old compared to younger age for cigarettes. So we're not talking about youth access. The last page, again, already been referred to, is I wanted to provide you with the legislative history for this section of the tobacco tax statute. Um, it, it, and again, I was going to point out, but it's already been pointed out several times, the committee has seen this prov provision before. Uh, and I certainly hope that the committee's, committee sees fit to dispose of this bill as uh, ha previous legislatures have. Um, on the, a note on the fiscal note, it's awful hard, awfully hard to determine um, because we may not know all of the sales and I'm not aware that DRA can score a fiscal note, if you will, dynamically. In other words, they don't anticipate what percentage of the New Hampshire sales go away. We believe there will be virtually no revenue increase if this bill is passed because the sales uh, in large part will go away. Um, so I'll close with um, a, an analogy, if you will, um, because it's been raised about taxing the other tobacco products. The way I look at it is calling a premium cigar the same as a cigarette, for example, would be the same as calling a filet mignon the same as a hot dog. We're talking about 100% leaf tobacco. We're talking about 100% beef versus the other two, which have many other ingredients in a completely different product. Um, so we don't think there's additional revenue. You'll lose the revenue that you're getting from the existing businesses. The science backs up our position. Uh, so we don't see any compelling reason to, uh, to pass the bill. We see a lot of reasons to keep the statute the way it is. Myself and Mr. Garofalo are happy to answer questions to the best of our ability. Representative Almy has a question. Thank you. Um, I actually lived in a cigar producing very small, very poor town in Brazil. Um, the Cuban expatriates had created it. Um, hand wrapped is not something you're going to be able to produce economically in the United States. Uh, so um, these are all imported. And could you tell me, I believe that there are huge numbers of small tobacco grower, uh, growers still producing cigars around the world and sending them to the United States, among other places. Madam Chair, if it's OK, I'd like to defer to one of the foremost cigar, uh, <laughs> most knowledgeable people about cigars that, that I've ever met, Mr. Right. Garofalo, if that's OK. Yes, um, because there does seem to be a problem with um, 
finding the distributors that are going to be paying the tax if they were taxed. Yeah, th th that part I couldn't speak to. I don't think either one of us could. That may be, it, it would rely, you'd rely upon DRA for, for their insight. And, and by the way, there are two companies based in New Hampshire um, that are cigar manufacturers, obviously don't actually produce them here. Um, Kirk Kendall with Twins uh, Smoke Shop has resurrected that 724 brand, which we see on the building in, in Manchester, uh, at one time the world's largest manufacturer of cigars. Uh, and there's another New Hampshire native uh, who has created a company, he was a former executive uh, for a manufacturer, um, retired from the, the large company and created a company he calls Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. Uh, he lives in Dunbarton um, and sells nationwide as well, produces elsewhere, but um, a fairly successful company. So, Representative Malloy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Sure. I think <clears throat> the information you have on, on uh, is very good. I appreciate the statistics. Uh, one, uh, and maybe it's in here somewhere, but if you were to draw a trend line of cigar usage per capita over the last 20, 25 years, what would that trend line look like? Up, down, sideways, uh, per capita usage, however you measure it. I'm, it's just a point of information for me. Sure. That's all. Understood. It, it, may I defer that one as well? Absolutely. Mr. Sure. Garofalo, if you'd share to join us. Um, and then we just need you to fill out a pink card. Curtis, you can show them how sure to do that. Do that. That'd be great. Welcome. Um, I'd say the past 20 years have been pretty flat um, as far as sales were. There was a boom in the early 1990s um, that boosted it up a little bit. Um, and uh, since then, it's been pretty flat for, uh, I would say, 25 years now. Other questions? Representative Orr's. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for taking my question. So are either of you aware that Cigars are still hand rolled in St. Augustine, Florida, because I've been there, and I'm wondering if you knew that. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, Tampa is is a, a place where cigars are still rolled. Um, J.C. Newman Cigar Factory, the last major size factory that's there. Little places for um, you know um, show basically where um, tourists or something would see it, but for for, ma for major consumption, uh, Tampa seems to be the last place left. As far as growing tobacco, uh, the Connecticut River Valley, including Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, um, Connecticut, obviously, um, is, is a, a bed of uh, growing. And now uh, Florida actually brought it back after 150 years. Uh, they're growing tobacco down in Florida now, too. We're talking uh, tobacco for cigars, which is a, actually a different product than a, a tobacco for anything else, including cigarettes. Thank you. Representative Ames. Yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know, um, what is the rule for online taxation by other states of uh, cigars? Um, the tax is for the state uh, that um, it collects it as the, the product is being sold. So um, there's uh, states take Massachusetts, for instance, the man that's still surviving uh, when I left Massachusetts uh, is L.J. Peretti in Boston. He's still there. Um, there were 30 of us uh, when I left. He's the last one that's standing. Uh, the bulk of his business is why he's even surviving. The one person that's surviving is the bulk of his business is sold online. And he sells that in a tax state, which is a 40% tax state. Uh, but when he sells it online, it's zero tax. So the majority of consumers, as Curtis said, um, if there is tax within the state, they'll choose to buy it in another state. Um, and, um, you know, they'll uh, not have to pay the tax as, as it would be. Um, there's, uh, by the way, if, if this tax was to happen, this would go from one of three lowest tax states to the highest. Yeah. Um, the, the number one highest right now is New York at 75%. This would be number two uh, in all the United States of the highest tax. Uh, I left Massachusetts at 12% tax. 
it was enough that would bury me because the the margins are not there, like he said. The margins can be maybe 30% when it comes to selling a box of cigars um, and a 12% disadvantage of that um, and adding sales tax, again, Massachusetts, compounding federal tax with state tax, with sales tax. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to survive, and I left. And um, I was basically laughed at for leaving because I was probably the number one guy in Boston at the time when I left. Um, but I knew that I would not be able to survive, and nor would these people that were other retailers that said, we'll be okay. They're all gone. Um, and the same thing will happen in New Hampshire uh, that will be gone and, you know, possibly going to one of those other states and selling within the state of New Hampshire, which there was no online sales when I left in 1995. Now it's a whole different game that, you know, just go somewhere else and just sell into the state. Mass uh, New Hampshire will get none of the tax uh, money because it won't add up to anything that will go in. And also there'll be 100 people plus lose their job and the businesses will go away. Yeah. There is no upsell to it uh, because of the way um, – tax goes from state to state when it comes to tobacco. Uh, uh, just to clarify. Follow up, yep. I'm sorry. Um, just to be sure I understand. So um, the the business that remains in Massachusetts, if it sells into Mass to a consumer or a place in Out Massachusetts, it's, it's Massachusetts tax, right? If, he, if they sell out of Massachusetts no, but into to Massachusetts. another state, it's zero tax. They'll collect nothing. Out of state, right. Yes. Out of state to uh, New Hampshire. So if the tax happened here in New Hampshire, I could sell to Massachusetts and give no tax to New Hampshire. Right, right. No, I think I understand. Okay. Representative Platt? My question, good answer with that okay, last exchange. Uh, re yes, Representative Elberger, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for taking my questions. I'm looking at the fact sheet that you gave us, and it points out, as you mentioned, that the uh, typical age for a cigar, a premium cigar smoker, is higher than for cigarettes. And you also point out that um, the typical premium cigar smoker is uh, better educated, perhaps, than the general population. Uh, I wonder if we can infer from that that the typical premium cigar smoker also has more disposable income than some others. I guess my sense is, to, to respond, it's a fair inference um, because it's true. As Representative Horgan said, premium cigars are not inexpensive. So that said... You know, if somebody, I think you'll find, and, and these folks will tell you, um, that cigar, premium cigar smoking is very seasonal. Another demonstration that it's not addictive. People will smoke more often when they're outdoors, they're mowing the lawn, they're on the boat, playing on the golf course. Um, so, you know, cigar smoking can be occasional as well. Um, so there may be some folks that are just a few times a year, and there are going to be some folks that are weekly or close to daily. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, hot dogs and filet mignon are beef. Well, hot dogs sometimes. <laughs> uh, but um, they're not the same product, but they're still taxed at the same rate. If you go to a restaurant and buy a hot dog and you buy filet mignon, you're taxed at the same rate, correct? Fair observation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just, this uh, question is for Mr. Garofalo. Uh, I'm curious, without putting any numbers on it, what taxes does your business pay or do you pay for your business activities in the state of New Hampshire? Uh, knock on wood, I've been doing this for 38 years. I started in the cigar business uh, 38 years ago, 1985. We pay business profits tax. I don't know what the numbers are, but we're successful, and um, we are um, one of the largest cigar retailers in the world, not just in the United States, in the world. Uh, thank you to New Hampshire, 
uh, for the New Hampshire Advantage, which certainly did that. I was a, a good retailer in Massachusetts. Um, and then as uh, taxes around us happen, um, I became one of the top retailers in the world. So uh, this is certainly profit. I, I pay what I'm supposed to pay, whatever that number is. And if I knew it off the top of my head, I would be happy to share it to proudly share it with you. Uh, it's successful. Um, we're certainly not taking a loss, even through COVID. Um, you know, I, I um, was not able to show a quarter that we didn't make profit on. So I, I couldn't collect because we made profit all the time. Uh, and a, as Curtis said, um, it is a um, product of uh, convenience, of when you have time to enjoy it. Our business drops um, probably about 80% in the winter months. So January, February, March, not, not very good at all. And, and there I would show you that, no, we're not very profitable at all. We, we may actually have a loss. When the weather gets good, uh, business gets really good. During COVID, people had time to enjoy cigars and our business actually took a bump up all of a sudden where uh, in most cases, a lot of places were hurting in business and uh, we ended up doing very well because people had time for it. When people went back to work, um, we do have a non-addictive product. The nicotine level in a cigar is between 1% and 3%. When you take other, to other products, period, uh, a tomato is 5% nicotine. Eggplant is 8% nicotine. A cigar is 1% to 3% nicotine. It's very, very small. Uh, it goes through a process to actually delete that to happen. It's just a natural byproduct of a nightshade-grown product, which is a tomato and eggplant. And uh, there's a little bit in it, but not enough to make people want to smoke outdoors in the cold, not want to do it when they're not comfortable to, to do it, when um, price has an issue to it, uh, they just stop. You know, we're looking at the economy right now as the slowdown happens. It happened in 2007, and we were the first to see the slowdown happen because nobody needs my product. And it, the more it, you make it difficult to people to uh, obtain it or pay extra for it, um, they check out. So I, I feel like the taxation, I, I know the taxation uh, ended up hurting uh, friends below us here in Massachusetts. Follow up, uh, if I may? Yeah, follow up. So that, I think that was very uh, interesting answer. In addition to the business profits tax, does your business pay a variety of other taxes? Every every tax we're supposed to pay meals and rum business enterprise absolutely liquor well uh, well indirectly through yeah, the Mr. Garoppolo does not have a cigar bar license at any of his does not have an operating cigar bar at any of his three uh, locations okay so you're just a retail sales operation not one of the cigar bars okay very good thank you Representative Plett I just wanted to thank you I'm going to start smoking eggplants <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Representative Ors. Thank you, Madam Chair, and stay away from me, Rep. Plutt. Uh, so thank you for taking my question. So you're telling us that uh, you can kind of see which way the economy is going by your cigar sales. So where is the economy going in 2023? Yes, it, I absolutely can. And, and when that happened in 2007, a lot of people thought that happened in 2008. And I, I was a barometer for the first thing that would somebody would give up. And it became light, literally lighting a $10 bill on fire uh, is the business that I'm in. And I saw it first and said, oh, here's what's happening. And then uh, friends and other businesses would see it, like restaurants would see it next. Uh, entertainment would see it as, it as it went down. Here we are in a bad first quarter of the year anyway, but business is down Q1 to Q1 last year. So I'd say the economy is, is uh, affecting us as we see it now. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we had a question over here. Representative Leapley, did I miss you? Yes, I did okay, have sorry. a question. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. This has been very interesting. Um, my question is, because it, it does, when you read the bill, it's weird that premium cigars are this special thing that is exempt from this tax. And it 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 is kind of a like playing field fairness question for me. I'm wondering if there is a tax amount that would seem fair. To you. So I'll tell you how this, this began, um, and um, it was brought up that there's some cigars that call themselves cigars, little cigars, and really what they are is cigarettes 
wrapped in brown paper, and they called themselves cigars. And they were never cigars, and they did that because there was an exemption on all cigars as taxed differently. So because these people did this, we now have to separate what a cigar is. That is not a, today, to this day, it's called a little cigar. It's a cigarette with brown paper instead of white paper. And then it became the next category would end up doing it. They'd call something else a cigar. The same thing happened with pipe tobacco. Pipe tobacco within the state is actually very, very high tax. You collect nothing on it because it's so used so little. But it was the cigarette companies that used roll your own cigarettes. It started calling it pipe tobacco. And then the government came in and said, I see what you're doing. Now we're going to tax pipe tobacco at 68%. And then nobody buys pipe tobacco in the state of New Hampshire. Nobody. It's, it's, if you figure out the money that it adds up to, it adds up to nothing because they buy it all online. I used to sell an awful lot of pipe tobacco, but at 68%, I don't sell to pipe tobacco anymore. Not only do it, it doesn't add up to anything, I don't even carry it anymore because nobody will buy it. If you tax cigars at 68%, I will not operate in the state of New Hampshire, period. I left at 15, 12. I left at 12%. It, it just will not end up happening because we have the opportunity, my customers have the opportunity to buy it from someone else, somewhere else. Follow up? Um, so is there a tax rate that you think would be fair to tax premium cigars? I think cigars? we're at the perfect tax rate <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thank uh, you. In one of those three states, and it is the New Hampshire advantage. My customers do drive up from multiple states. Uh, as I told you, as I proudly say, uh, we sell an awful lot of cigars. Um, and when they do come up, they buy lottery tickets. They buy the liquor in the liquor stores. They use the restaurants. They, they maybe stay at the hotels. They don't use the, the roads. They don't use the police. They don't use the fire department. They drop all their money off to everything, and then they leave. What better, what better customer in the world would you want than this? And these people have money. Yes, it is a, a disposable income type of person. And some of these people have a lot of money to drop lots of money off in the state. Uh, don't let them go away because th there's nothing but negative that's going to happen. They're going to not come anymore and drop it off and you will collect no money. Just ask Massachusetts. They had the same thing that they thought they were going to make a few million dollars in Massachusetts in 1995 when they added the tax. That was at 12 percent. They went to 15, they went to 20, they went to 30, they went to 40, and they're still chasing this dream of $3 million. There's one guy left. The guy doesn't do $3 million in sales. You can tax him 10,000%. It can't add up to any money that ends up happening. It's just bad business. Uh, and um, those poor retailers uh, that had to figure out something else uh, after the fact. And uh, knock on wood, I was one that actually packed my bags and left, but uh, nobody else followed. They stayed, they stayed and went down with the ship. Uh, if this was to happen, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm not going to go down with the ship. I'm just going to close shop and maybe go to Florida. It's warm there. It's you know, it's not cigar a bad, city, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Representative Almy has a question. I'm not sure I need to ask it of you, but um, can you visualize any way that? Or can you visual? Can you tell us the impediments to us collecting tax? on a product which has gone mostly online. Well, that's another thing of collecting the tax. So, and somebody would have to do, and I, I've asked the question many times of the non-premium um, cigar, how much is really coming in on non-premium cigars? And I've, I've asked it year after year, and, and they have no calculation to it. So it, it's very minuscule, the tax you're collecting on pipe tobacco at 68%. It's, it's virtually nothing. And how much you're getting on non-premium cigars, it, it's virtually nothing. And I, I could build my business even more if you would not tax that. Uh, make that go away, too, because you're collecting nothing for it and you're just hurting the retailers that are in here. Uh, so I, I would go as far as to, you know, instead of play defensive here, play offensive and say, will you please take that other tax off that is just sitting there making you no money and hurting the, the uh, people of New Hampshire at the same time. We, we could uh, do better if we could make that go away as opposed to try to, uh, what does it cost you to collect the tax? There's, there's 
uh, people that's job is trying to figure that out and to collect it, it may be worth less. You may be spending more money trying to collect this little amount of money um, than, you, than it's worth. And I would even go on to say that Massachusetts trying to collect this little 40% of this little amount that is happening within that state is probably not worth, worth their while. It certainly isn't $3 million or $1 million. Representative Ellery, did I see your hand over there? Yes. Okay, yes. D d just for edification purposes, uh, and, and I was there when this went through, so. But when you're talking about the little cigar, the cigarello type thing, I seem to recall some testimony regarding its construction compared to that of a premium cigar, where premium cigar is, is uh, leaf rolled, preferably from Connecticut because they make the best uh, wrapper, and then material from whichever one of the various different you know places that makes the next best tobacco. But if I remember your testimony at that time, you were talking about scrapings and floor sweepings and bits and pieces and stuff going into the cigarello or the little cigar, which is which, which, one of the reasons for the differences. Shop tobacco, which is how a cigarette is made, I mean, they can make a thousands and thousands of cigarettes in a minute, where a cigar, a pair of two people making cigars make 300 per day. Two people make 300 cigars per day, where the machine makes 300 a second um, of making these cigarettes. Whether they use brown paper or white paper, that doesn't matter. One other thing that came up back in those days was the um, other cigars that you may see in a convenience store. And those were uh, flavored cigars that if you tip them upside down, all the tobacco comes out. What, why would that end up happening? It's little pieces of tobacco that's inside of this, quote, cigar. And all this was was the wrapper that was used, and then it was to be refilled with marijuana. And this was uh, um, just another way of... of rolling uh, as, as a not a uh, I can't think of what that's called a rolling paper I guess that people would um, put marijuana in or they would use a leaf which was this cigar that you poured out and I believe we had an example uh, representative Al Almy I think you brought the products in if you remember back that I brought a lot of products in there yes. was nothing with marijuana uh, in no no I knew of. <laughs> There was banana flavor, chocolate flavor, Correct. orange flavor, and very little low levels of tobacco because it was meant and a, to And it called children. itself a cigar, and it was not a cigar. So what we tried to do is say this, when I got in the business in 1985, all there were was cigars. And then these companies came in and started making believe their product was a cigar. And it's not. So we we were the first state in the country to actually define what a cigar was, just to say these other things are not. And that gave us the exemption of it. The, the exemption is cigars. The other things, if you say, well, why aren't the other cigars or the inexpensive cigars? Because they're not cigars. I know what a cigar is and what a cigar isn't. Those are not cigars, and they're not even pretending to be. It's just they're pretending in writing to be, as that roll-your-own cigarette is not pipe tobacco. You cannot smoke it in a pipe. It's made for roll-your-own cigarettes, but we're taxing it in the state. It's 68% because they call it that, but it is different. There could, there could be maybe a definition of what pipe tobacco is because these other people that do this kind of ruin it for the entire industry, making believe that their product is different. Representative Ulrey? She said with trepidation. <laughs> are you telling me that zigzags are used for something other than tobacco? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Any serious questions? Representative <laughs> Rochford. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I I'm just trying to wrap my head around because I Just in full disclosure, we have a premium cigar store in my town. I've never been into it. I wouldn't know a good cigar from a bad cigar. Um, but uh, I, I look at the business that they're doing in my town. We're a border town, bordering Vermont. I go up 
19 miles north to the town of Lancaster, where we have a cigar bar there, uh, where people come from all around to 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 drink and to, to smoke cigars. I, I'm just trying to understand this, and bear with me here, and I will get to a question. Um, I look at, you know, efforts to tax flavored cigarettes or flavored tobacco in an effort to get kids off of it. But you've said this isn't an addictive issue. It's not a health concern. Or is it a children? Children aren't it's interested. Children in aren't in, our children aren't interested. So we can check that off the box. Am I missing something here? I just think that this is a this bill here is a solution looking for a problem. The answer is that. I, my, I mean, I. I I don't see that this is the pressing issue New Hampshire has to solve today. 100%. All right. That's our assessment as well. Thank you. Any other questions? I Yes, there's a question. Representative Almy. Actually, I'd just like to make a statement. I smoked my first and last cigar at the age of eight with my cousin. We stole it from our grandfather, and neither of us ever smoked again. <laughs> And it did it. It did its duty to stop me from that. Mm -hmm. No child would be like that. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for, your Thank you for coming. And oh, sir, don't forget to fill out the pink card. Thank you so much. Okay, and we have Keen Wong here from the DRA, who can probably answer any final questions we have. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Um, my name is Keen Ming Wong, Tax Policy Counsel of the Department of Revenue. Uh, the department does not have a position on this bill. Uh, we did prepare a fiscal note um, on the bill. And um, this bill, as described by the sponsor, is uh, proposing to tax the premium cigars uh, under the tobacco tax statute. Uh, when we uh, were preparing the fiscal note, uh, it wasn't clear to us um, the tax rate uh, that was going to be used on the uh, cigars. So when we prepared this fiscal note, we assumed that it is taxed as an other tobacco product, which is at 65.03% uh, of the wholesale price. Um, preparing this fiscal note, we used, uh, as explained in previous testimony, there is um, no complete information uh, for us to calculate the total fiscal impact if uh, if this bill were to pass. However, we did try to uh, get as much information as possible through looking at uh, the returns that's been submitted. So uh, wholesalers do submit a return to us on a monthly basis, wholesalers who sell other tobacco products. And within that return, that is called a Form DP-151, within that return, the wholesalers do report uh, the amount of premium cigars that's sold in New Hampshire. And bear in mind, this is only for the wholesalers who do sell other tobacco products and they are licensed in New Hampshire. So wholesalers that only sell premium cigars will not be captured in this population of our calculation. And within our calculation, we've determined that it, uh, that the wholesale price for premium cigars that were sold in New Hampshire from fiscal year 22 was about $1.4 million, and applying the 65.03% uh, will give us $967,000 of um, revenue. And as mentioned in previous testimony, the DRA does not have the capability of determining whether the uh, an increase or imposition of this tax would result in a loss in sale or an increase in sale. Uh, we, we do not have that capability. We are only able to report on what available data that we have. Representative Almy. Thank you. Um, we assume that a number of the people who were buying on in place are going to be buying online. Do you have any way to find those people? 
I, I, not to my knowledge that we we're able to determine whether the um, they're buying online or buying at the store. Most likely, if they're buying online, um, any purchases that's done online, the consumer will be the ones who are reporting the taxes. Versus if they're buying at the store, the um, the whole the wholesaler will have to report that tax. So that that probably will be the only way we could de determine that. Thank you. And for the case of cigarettes, on the the on cigarette uh, the tobacco settlement uh, includes fibbing on everybody who bought tobacco to bought cigarettes online from the participating manufacturers. That is, uh -huh. and you go after them, but. There is no such mechanism, I think, for for uh, any other product. Yeah, I I believe not, since if it's not covered under the um, the settlement agreement. Yeah. Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, your fiscal note calculations are based on a static analysis and that is correct. therefore they're predicated on current sales volume. That is correct. Do you imagine that the imposition of a 65% wholesale tax would dampen sales volume and therefore reduce the anticipated revenue? Um, Without being able to quantify it, does that seem likely? We, we would not be able to predict consumer behavior. Um, so it, it's... We will not be able to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. Point made. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I don't have any more pink cards. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on House Bill 510? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. We will now open the public hearing on House Bill 568. Uh, we have received an email message. I hope everyone on the committee received it um, from the prime sponsor who said he did not want to move forward with this bill. I believe it still would be in order for someone to introduce it and then we could conclude the public hearing. Uh, Representative Fellows, would you care to introduce this bill? The bill before us today is House Bill 568 relative to assessing all the state adequate education and local education costs through the state education warrant. And because I am not the sponsor, um, I don't have any testimony to offer about this bill. Thank you for the, for so much for introducing the bill. And let me just read the uh, email that we received from the prime sponsor. Uh, Representative Sanborn, uh, yes, I guess it was sent to me and I hopefully forwarded it to everyone else. I have decided not to follow through with House Bill 568-FN relative to assessing all state adequate education and local education costs through the state education warrant. I would like to withdraw it. The bill is not written the way I intended and the timing is not right for amending. Uh, please advise me if there's anything else I need to do to vacate the bill. So the gentleman requested the bill to be vacated, but it was too late to be vacated per the House clerk uh, because it had already been scheduled for public hearing here. So that's why we've opened the public hearing. Uh, is there anyone in the audience here to testify on House Bill 568? Anyone from the committee have anything to say? Yes, Representative Platt. Am I correct that if uh, with a situation like this, if the minority leader and the chair agree, we could uh, exec immediately? and uh, dispose of it? I believe uh, that is the new House rule that we've adopted. Um, we have not discussed this at all, so I wouldn't want to 
presume anything, but we can certainly close the public hearing and we can discuss whether an immediate exec session would be in order. So uh, with that, I will close the public hearing on House Bill 568. So uh, this is a public work session of the entire House Ways and Means Committee, and we are discussing House Bill 568 as well as a recently passed House rule that would allow us to immediately go into an executive session on a bill if we have agreement uh, between the chair, the members of the committee, and the ranking member of the committee to exec a bill that was just heard that same day. We have a situation here in front of us with House Bill 568, which the prime sponsor has asked us not to move forward with. So I believe we have consensus. Representative Almey, would you like to tell us how you feel about exacting this bill now? I agree. Okay, so we will now enter the, uh, an executive session on House Bill 568, and the chair will recognize Representative Janigian for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to ITL HB 568. Do we have a second? second. Representative Almy? Um, any discussion? Just... Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, discussion is very succinct. It's pretty much what you just said. We, we actually have written uh, a written email from the prime sponsor basically saying he would like to withdraw the bill. So at this point, it makes total sense. We're all in agreement to uh, ITL it. Would the clerk call the roll on the motion of ITL? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Janigian. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry I stumbled earlier. It's all right. It's the alcohol. <laughs> no, the, the eggplant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Representative Ullery. Not having heard anything about the bill. Yes. <laughs> Representative uh, Doucette. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Platt votes yes. Uh, Representative Hines not here. Uh, uh, Representative Sodi. Yes. Representative Ors. Yes. Representative Rochford. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. He had to leave. Okay. Fine. Uh, Representative Southworth. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Rep Representative Fellows. Yes. Representative Bolton. Yes. Representative Elberg. Yes. Representative Leapley. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. And the chair. Yes. Okay, the vote is 17 uh, to zero and three not present. So we learned that we can put an ITL'd 
Well, we can put a bill on consent calendar with a unanimous vote. This one does have an FN, but we can put it on consent calendar because it's an ITL motion. So we will put on consent unless anyone objects. Seeing none, we will close the executive session on House Bill 568. Okay, thank you for working with me on that parliamentary <laughs> thing. <laughs> we are done for the day, and we will see you tomorrow at 10 so we can begin the fun stuff of revenue estimates. Thank you. See if we can. We can. There's just another one on the Well, oh, look, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're doing it appropriately, and I just thought we were just having a chat. It's perfectly. Yeah. Too many, yeah. Okay, well, I'll put their wrong dog on, on record. We have to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we work it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah